If you'll stand for the invocation and the pledge. Our Father, our hearts are heavy tonight with the plane that went down and the 295 victims in the Ukraine today. Lord, we ask for peace. Please, please be with all of us and bring us together to act in the best interest of the Clay County Schools and our students. And Lord, we ask that you be with Chuck Bullock, who has been so ill this past week. Help Tina to stay strong and give Chuck good health very soon. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The July 17, 2014 meeting of the Clay County School Board will come to order. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the school board meeting. This forum is for us, your elected representatives, to discuss and decide the direction we take within our public schools and the education of our children here in Clay County. If you wish to address the board, please complete one of the green cards that are available in the back of the room and indicate the item number or topic you wish to address. Please turn your card in promptly. There will be one opportunity to speak with the allotted time of three minutes. No cards will be accepted from the audience once the board moves to the discussion agenda. Please limit your comments to the issue. Your participation is welcomed and appreciated. Ms. Stoddard, I have one question, please. Yes. Um, are you going to allow green card comments to item 41 scheduled citizens request? Uh, I'll we have a few filled out, so they need to change it if you're not. Um, I will give them an opportunity to change it. Uh, I would like to state uh, for the record, at this time I am striking agenda item number 41 from the agenda. The reasons that I am striking it are, one, it was placed on the agenda after the agenda was reviewed and approved by me and was done without my knowledge. Number two, it was placed on the agenda contrary to board policy. Three, board policy 1.02E4 gives the board chairman the final authority to determine what shall or shall not be included on the agenda. So we won't need cards for that. If they would like to fill out a card, though, they can give, put in a card up until we start the discussion agenda. That would be fine. Madam Chairman, I do need to clarify you're in error on items one and two that you just read. Item three, you do have final authority, but you did see these, and you struck them, and they are lined through, so they are stricken, and it's noted that you struck them, and this was done with your knowledge. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to, uh, at this time, also ask... I noticed today on our school board website that the policy that uh, we uh, implemented has not been changed on our website, so it gives an inaccurate uh, wording to what our knowledge. Uh, the, the new language said the school board chair shall have the final authority to determine what shall or shall not be included on the published or advertised agenda for any school board meeting. This policy shall be interpreted broadly to include all agenda items at all school board meetings and shall include but shall not be limited to decisions to include or exclude any items submitted under policy 1.02 E9B. No agenda item submitted by a board member may be removed from the agenda without that board member's authorization. So I would like to ask that the website uh, be updated before our next board meeting. Uh, the next, we have the adoption of the consent agenda. We, Mr. Bittner, did we have one item that was pulled? I believe you sent an email today and I don't, didn't write it down. I pulled C25 and it does show that it's been pulled. 
um, okay. on the consent agenda. Okay, so it's already pulled. All right. So I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda. I'll move approval. Second. Have a motion by Ms. Carricus, second by Ms. Bullock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, <coughs> next we have our recognitions and awards. Recognize Tammy Masden, Guidance Counselor, Oak Leaf High. Uh, Mr. Wingate. Good evening. Once again, we're very proud to be here to recognize one of our school board employees, and that is Mrs. Tammy Masden from Oak Leaf High School, a Guidance Counselor. Let me just read to you what this uh, has to do with this trophy has to do, and this is a beautiful trophy now. Yes. Okay, uh, Ms. Mazin is being honored tonight because she is, be, she is being presented the, as the winner of the first annual Colin Powell Award. This award represents a Clay County guidance counselor who has demonstrated a high level of support for the students interested in joining the armed forces. Various military recruiters nominated Mrs. Mazin based on her interaction with the students and their observation of her efforts with our young people. This award was given out about a month and a half ago at the Jacksonville Baseball Fairgrounds, and Mrs. Mazden could not be there, so we accept the award for her. And uh, we want to present that tonight. Uh, as you know, all of our schools do a great job, and our district philosophy has always been we've got students out there that are interested in the military. Let's try to work with our military recruiters and our, our guidance counselors, our administrators, our teachers. They all try to, to help us out in this area. So. The first annual General Colin Powell Award, and this was again given or selected by the military recruiters, goes to Mrs. Tammy Mazden from Oakleaf High School. I think that's bigger than she is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wingate, especially for the kind words. This is a true honor and a privilege to hold this award, but the true thank you goes to our young men and women who just graduated and serve in our country now. So I will hold this in their honor. Thank you. Next, Linda Lancaster to recognize the 2013-14 retirees. Good thank evening. you, Madam Chair. It is, once again, my privilege to uh, bring to you the, the names of just a few of our retirees that, gra that uh, graduated, retired during the 13-14 school year um, in our district. Uh, I always like to share with you the number and the number of years. We had 100 retirees this year with a total of 2,208 2, years of service to our district. Um, I would also like to recognize Janine Clark, who's in the back, who has spent tireless hours assisting all of these folks in this retirement process, whose help I could not do without. And then I would like to um, give you the procedure for tonight. I'm going to call your names. If you will come up and receive your certificate from the superintendent and then remain in, remain in the center of the uh, stairs there for a final picture, uh, please feel free to do so. All right, Suzanne Foster. Bonnie Ham. Gwen Hanna. Linda Hartley. Carol Littles. Marsha Norman. Yeah. 
Daryl Pratt. Carol Sertivan. Odin Tyre. And Shirley Wright. And after Shirley, if Mr. Van Zant would uh, agree to say a few words, I'm sure we'd appreciate it. Well, folks, uh, different amounts of service, different time. Uh, but to those assembled here tonight, just know there's a couple things that make Clay County Schools truly unique. One is the strong families we have, and another is undeniably the strength of character of our workforce, our teachers, our support people, our administrators. They do phenomenal work, and they take whatever comes in the door and whatever state of mind a, a child or a family is every day and do just close to miraculous things on a daily basis. And I just am so proud and honored to serve as your superintendent and thank you so much for your service here. And if we can get everybody to squeeze in like they like each other and Miss Lancaster, and I don't know who else should be in this picture. Oh, just me? Okay. That's a lot of years of that we're going to be, oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, next, um, recognize completers of preparing new principal requirements, Dr. Michael Henry. Good evening, Madam Chair. In my capacity as Director of Human Resources, I oversee the district's HRMD program. One component of this program is the process of assistant and vice principals obtaining school principal certification from the Florida Department of Education. Tonight, the Division of Human Resources wishes to recognize seven of our assistant and vice principals who have completed all of the requirements for level two school principal certification. These administrators submitted an exhaustive portfolio that was reviewed by Ms. Diane Carnegie that includes documentation of a host of administrative experiences that focuses on a myriad of administrative and instructional functions that undergird the work of 21st century principalship. These administrators have also enhanced their skill sets in the areas of effective decision-making strategies, school vision and culture, and building community and stakeholder partnerships. At this time, I would like to recognize the following assistant and vice principals for their noteworthy achievement. Please come up front when your name is called to be recognized and stand in the middle here. Clayton Anderson, Orange Park High School. Kim Marks, Plantation Oaks Elementary School. <laughs> Becky Murphy, Fleming Island High School. <laughs> Michael Randolph, Oak Leaf High School. <laughs> Heather Roche, Coppergate Elementary School. Melanie Sanders, Keystone Heights Elementary School. Applause 
And last but not least, Tammy Winkler, all the way from Middleburg Elementary School. And at this time, we're going to ask the superintendent to come down. We're going to ask the deputy superintendent that serves on that committee, along with the, the assistant superintendent of human resources, Ms. Tony McCabe, and Diane Cornegie. She serves on that committee also. And I think I'm going to get in the picture, too. That's a great group of future principals there. Very good. Okay, there are no presenters. Um, this will be the last call for green cards. Is there anyone else who wants to fill out a green card before we go to the discussion agenda? Okay, then we'll continue on. Uh, I do want to uh, ask the uh, consensus of the board on something. Uh, when I was talking to Dr. Copeland today uh, about the budget presentation, it seems that every month, by the time we get to the budget, we're all uh, brain dead and half asleep, and I think Dr. Copeland is too, but uh, since we are going over the general fund and we're right in the, and going to be approving the tentative budget, uh, with your agreement, I would like to move the, the business affairs items up to the first thing on the discussion agenda. Does that suit you all? I think that way we'll be fresh and we can, can hear it. So um, the first item is review the 2013-14 final uh, estimated budget. Dr. Copeland. Let's see, Carl. Oh, wait a minute. Dr. Copeland. Ma'am. Could I ask you to give me just three minutes? Because I just noticed we do have a green card on this item. Uh, Liz Crane. I'm sorry, I almost forgot you, Ms. Crane. It's okay. Uh, good, after good evening. Liz Crane, CCA Treasurer and CCA Representative on the Insurance Committee, speaking on behalf of CCEA as Renna Lee is on vacation. 2285 Marshawk Lane, 15205 Orange Park, Florida, 32003. Um, I have some good news to share as a welcome at our school board meetings, especially under a budget item. Today, I, as well as many of our employees, received a letter from the Health Options Incorporated regarding our insurance premiums. This letter is dated July 11, 2014. Per this letter, the school board will be receiving a rebate of a portion of our health insurance premiums. This is due to the Affordable Health Care Act. Per ACA, the medical loss ratio is calculated on a state-by-state -state basis. In Florida, health options did not meet the 85-15 standard. In 2013, health options spent only 84.2% of total premium dollars on health care and activities to improve health care. Our medical loss ratio in 2013 was approximately 80%. For the 13-14 year, it was 79% on a 12-month rolling average. The plan year of October to April with Florida Blue, our loss ratio was 71.8%. We argued ad nauseum at the committee meetings that because of our demonstrated trend, we earned a lower increase. Florida Blue would not have it. They were scared that all of a sudden 5,000 employees would contract some incurable disease and the loss ratio would increase over 100%. ACA also states that if our group health plan is a non-federal governmental plan, the employer must distribute the rebate in one of two ways, reducing premiums for the upcoming year, 
or providing a cash rebate to employees who are covered by the health insurance on which the rebate is based. Note, it does not say that the employer may use this rebate as he sees fit. This money is to return to the employees and it shall. Last month, when the board met for the insurance workshop, I spoke about the union's posi position in regards to the Florida Blue proposal. I voted no as a CCA representative of that committee to accept Florida Blue's 9% increase. I still stand by that vote. The committee was never informed that this rebate was even a possibility, not by the district, AON, or Florida Blue. I was informed by a CCA member who contacted me, confused and angry, that she receives a letter saying that there will be a rebate when she knows the board approved a 9% increase. At this point, the only information I have is from this letter. I'm incensed that the superintendent or his representative did not call for a meeting or at the very least inform the committee that, uh, that this letter was being sent out to the employees. I find it hard to believe that the employees of this district were the first to hear about this. I look forward to hearing about how much of the rebate we will be receiving and how it will be rebated back to the employees of this district. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Copeland. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. It's my privilege to review with you tonight the superintendent's uh, budget that has been prepared for your review. Um, <clears throat> I have provided each of you a budget book uh, in that, let's just go over that just for a second. Uh, at the beginning of that budget book is the FEFP br briefing. Uh, that is uh, a review uh, of all of the programs uh, that are included in the FEFP for the Clay County School District. These are the individual funds that we receive uh, for the 14-15 school year. Uh, you can go through each of these uh, pages. You will be able to understand <clears throat> how the, these funds are generated, uh, explanations of the different categories within the FEFP funding, and a history of the FEFP funding for the Clay County School District over 10 or 15 years. Um, I will let you uh, take that and you can study that if you have questions. Um, please give me a call. It's for your uh, understanding of how the FEFP formula works and how we generate funds uh, within the school district. Uh, so that's the first part of the budget book. <clears throat> the second portion um, is the is a uh, executive review of um, the general fund, um, and so. Included in this review, you will find three years. You will find the 12-13 actual year. You will have the current or the previous year, 13-14, that we just completed. And then you will find the 14-15 year, uh, the year that we're in now, and <coughs> it contains um, uh, much information. Um, I will remind you that this is a tentative budget. The trim process uh, actually started on July the 1. The budget process started back in December. Uh, Ms. Adams requests from all of the schools uh, estimates of their enrollments for the 14-15 year. As you can understand, that estimate is 12 months from actually getting a count of the actual uh, students in our school district. But based on that count in December, that goes to the Department of Education, and based on revenues that are estimated for the 14-15 year, um, then they, the Department of Education, the Department of Revenue, prepares estimates for all school districts. And so that's basically how the process starts in December. There's a revenue estimating conference in February, March, uh, then uh, based on assessed values that are estimated, uh, mill levies are estimated uh, that are given to school districts to prepare their tentative budget. My, a Tuesday, I received what is referred to as the second calculation. The second calculation um, is the, uh, 
it contains the required local effort and uh, based on that mill levy some of our revenues have changed uh, since the first calculation so uh, that close timeline creates a lot of work at the last minute so why don't we go through the um, in your second tab and I have this here on the um, screen is the general fund executive review 2007-08 through 2014-15 estimated after that um, then if you'll go back to your budget book there is um, tab 100 called fund 100 uh, this basically takes the place of that uh, but I may hit just a few other slides as we quickly go through fund 100 then I will review fund 200 which is the debt service of the school district then um, I will turn the time over to um, uh, Mr. Merrill and he can do whatever he would like on part three uh, fund 300 capital outlay uh, and then I'll turn this over to our director of school food services and she will come up and review school food services and um, then I will quickly go through uh, fund 420 and fund 434 take just a few minutes and then complete fund 711 which is the self-insured fund okay <clears throat> I'll try to speak up I don't see the microphone that's okay I think I can speak up all right wait is there a microphone we're not it's not uh, mr. Rollins is there a microphone that he could use Okay, if you could, maybe if you pull it over as close to you as you can get the mic, uh, the podium mic, Dr. Copeland, pull, bend, bend it over as close as you can All get right. it to you. There you go. Okay, first we have the, looks like it didn't get all on the, the first slide is for 2012-13. If you want to follow through the book, you can it's also up here the 2012-13 final basically what this slide does is tells us the percent of revenue from federal state and local revenue the majority of our funds comes through the uh, state that amount of 171.6 million is primarily from the FEFP formula um, we get um, federal funds we get local funds the thank you the uh, local funds are primarily from property tax. So for 2012-13, we received in revenue approximately 236.5 million. Another interesting area is non-recurring. It's called non-recurring because it's you can't count on it every year. These funds are primarily from Mr. Merrill that comes in to the general fund to pay for the services that our maintenance department uh, spends out in the schools to do maintenance work that primarily are capital oriented and so since these this work is capital related then we're able by law to be able to pull in those part three funds uh, to help us with that next is the <coughs> operate the uh, expenditures for 2012-13 I think the important thing to understand here is that in that year we had to pull from fund balance approximately 6.1 million uh, again the majority of our expenditures are found in the salaries and benefits uh, that are approximately 88 percent of our budget um, so the operating expenses are such a small portion uh, but the majority is certainly in our benefits and salaries and you'll see that the cost of our benefits is going up considerably uh, even as we try to control the cost of our payrolls and salaries 
uh, the real cost that is beginning to happen is in the benefit area. In 1314, uh, this is referred to as the final estimated budget for the 1314 year. And again, the majority of our funds comes from the state, again, the FEFP. Uh, you can see that the non recurring is uh, increasing basically for the same reason. Uh, federal and local, again, our property taxes. You can see that we had a pretty good year. We only had to use approximately $111,000 of our fund balance to balance the budget. As we get to the end of a fiscal year, there is a lot of adjustments, many adjustments that are made between programs, uh, between school food services, between capital outlay, between federal programs. And so uh, we are able to <coughs> reclass some general fund expenditures against those other programs, which helps us tremendously to balance the budget. Um, so I think that pretty much tells us uh, for the 13-14 year. Now, <clears throat> the cost of our salary increases. I'll continue to point out that the majority of our cost is in salary and benefits. And you can see over the years the, um, the cost of these salary increases. For the 13-14 year, we increased the salaries by 6.9 million. Uh, we, under, we know that 6.1 of that was uh, earmarked for teachers, uh, and then the additional 800,000 was with the uh, um, SESPA, and that was really for a partial year. That 800,000 was for a partial year. In the 14-15 year, we'll have to annualize that amount, and you'll see that uh, if you look to the 14-15 year on your book, uh, you see that that cost included in the 14-15 year budget is approximately 400,000. So then we'll have the full cost of uh, of the salary increase that was provided for SESPA, SESPA beginning in 13-14. is a um, slide on our percent of salaries and benefits. Again, I point out that for a number of years, we have been at 87, 88%. Until we control that, we'll continue to have this uh, need for our fund balance. The revenues are not increasing at the same rate that we need to stay up with our cost. Um, so my recommendation is that we try our best to control those costs for salaries and benefits. For the 13-14 year, it was 88%, and for the 14-15 year, it's estimated at 87%. Let's look at our revenue and expense over the years. As you look back to 2007-8, you can see that our expenditures in red exceeded our revenue, and that this gap here in 8-9 is significant, requiring a significant drawdown on fund balance. And uh, then uh, in 9-10, uh, we were able to decrease our expenditures and our revenue actually exceeded it by a couple of million dollars. Dr. Copeland, could you point out those two years where it looks like we spent less than we took in were really the years that we had that uh, federal stimulus package and we expensed reoccurring expense to that one-time money. So it's kind of a false positive there. Yes. We weren't really <clears throat> in the black. Uh, in 2010-11, uh, many governmental entities received state fiscal stabilization funds. We had to treat that as a federal program indicated by the four uh, on the 431. That's where we accounted for those funds. We were allowed to decrease the expenditures <clears throat> in the general fund 
and move those over <coughs> to those uh, state fiscal stabilization fund programs. And so therefore, that is a big reason why our expenditures did decrease and move over to those federal programs. That went on for a couple of years. We also did receive some job education funds in 1213, <coughs> uh, about seven million, and we were allowed to take of that five million and to use towards salaries within the general fund. Matter of fact, we moved that money out of a federal project into the general fund, which was allowed for us to do. So as we <coughs> go forward here, uh, the, if you'll look at your book, it's probably the easiest way to see it, is that in 1314, uh, barely, barely our revenue exceeded our expenditures. And that's why we only had to bring in approximately 111,000. But now let me tell you the reason why we only needed 111,000. Because in Mr. Merrill's budget, I take considerable amount, everything that I can identify of those maintenance workers that works out in the schools. Um, also in um, our school food services, um, Ms. Glover will certainly indicate how often I go to her to take from her great work and through indirect cost and uh, direct expenses, um, I charge some expenditures to her. And Ms. Glover is, has done a fantastic job with school food services and thank goodness for that. So without those funds and being able to also reclass some general fund expenditures to federal programs, we would be in significant problems. As we look, um, let's go on here and I'll, okay, fund balances. The unassigned fund balance. This is probably the big question that we have every year, the state has every year. Where are school districts as far as an unassigned fund balance? Um, and the state has set a minimum of 3% of revenues to be in an unassigned fund balance. Unassigned means it's available for appropriation. It is basically a rainy day fund. If you need to go to that uh, and appropriate expenditures that are not known at a certain point through the year, you can go to that and pull those out. We bring those, that information to you every month in budget amendments and requests that we dip into our fund balance. But as you can see, back in the good days, uh, these are the amounts of unassigned, 9.61%, 8.5, drops to 4%, 5.2, and again now, uh, some of the reasons why uh, this fund balance is increasing is because we have moved expenditures of payroll and benefits to federal programs. So it is a little misleading, uh, but that's what we were allowed to do. In 2012-13, uh, we started the year at 3.91%, and at the end of that year, uh, as you well know, we finished with 2.12. Um, I think we've, uh, we've talked about this a number of times, how that affects our bond rating. Uh, we've been on many phone calls with bond rating agencies trying to help them understand the path that we're going to follow to get back at a 3% unassigned fund balance because they look at that as much as the state looks at it. And so last year, we, for a few hours, we had um, um, a conference call with Fitch uh, and uh, on our bond rating, and uh, we indicated to them that our bond, that our unassigned fund balance was falling below 3%. The superintendent had to write a letter to the state indicating that we were falling below 3%, and we finished the year. Um, 1213 at 2.12%. So, we've had many discussions about 
how do we get that back to 3%? And basically, we have discussed two to three years to get that back, and um, uh, that's been our challenge. Uh, as you know, one of the real areas uh, that hurt us was to lose that quarter mill. That quarter mill for four years brought us approximately four and a half million dollars. Two and a half from the citizens of Clay County through their property tax and the matching from the state uh, to bring us up to the state average based on our unweighted FTE. So, um, as we get to the end of 1314, we were very fortunate to end with uh, a fund balance, an unassigned fund balance of 2.24%. So we did increase from 2.12 to 2.24. That is not where we want to be. We can't be below 3% too much longer. And so uh, our goal in the next couple of years is to get that from 2.12 to 2.24 back up to 3%. So that's where we are for 1314. Um, our assessed value, um, as you can see, really a number of years ago, growth was tremendous. There was building going on, and that building increased our assessed value. However, in the last two or three years, uh, growth within the, the county has slowed down significantly. And, um, but as I discussed this with the county assessor, uh, the growth in our assessed value um, is improving. As you can see from 2013-14, our assessed value was 9,181,191,948 dollars. It increased over 300,000. And um, so for 2014-15, uh, $9,562,000,000 will be our estimated assessed value. One of the problems that we have had in prior year, or the last couple of years, is in our growth. We in increased enrollment. Um, as you well understand, when we are growing, we hire more personnel, more teachers. We want to be at class size. That's been an important thing for the, for the school district. However, when we start declining, we still have the payroll, we still have the employees, but now with the enrollment going down, we have less revenue from the state through the FEFP. The funding we receive from the state is based on enrollment. Uh, so, 73% of our funding comes from the state and approximately 26% comes from the uh, local property tax. So, as you can see, back in July 13th, a year ago, we had an enrollment of 34,541. In the fourth calculation, which comes out approximately in April of that fiscal year, 13-14, we increase significantly. The problem now is that as we estimate 1415 from the fourth calculation that the 35,244 was generated to the second calculation of 1415, we have declined 427 unweighted. And when you weight that, that is 619 weighted. FTE and an FTE on the weighted uh, calculation generates about four thousand dollars per weighted FTE. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Copeland, may I interject? Mm -hmm. Can you move that? Can the slide move over just a hair so they can see the July 2014? I to don't come know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Someone a lot smarter than me, or help. even a little bit smarter than me, can do that. Okay. Hey, money. Yeah, perfect. That's perfect. Just like that. That's good. That's perfect. Good. 
I certainly don't want to muddy the water here, but I think, I think what is important for us to, to just remember as we struggle to project and build a budget is that number you're seeing on July 2013, that 34,541, that was not the number we turned in in December. December, remember in December you turn in your projection. And for years, what you turn in December, you get funded on in your second, or that projection there. Well, last year, you've heard me talk about FTE light. So we turned in 34, I want to say 781, I think it was. And then we found out in that second projection, they only funded us at 34,549, okay? So then this past fall, when we were building the projection for the 14-15 school year, we um, had to consider what our FTE was in October, what our principals told us it was. We took those numbers. We had to look at FTE in a totally different way because when you first collected FTE in October, because of the new way they were having us calculated, it was overstated. Then they come back in and they do something called recalibration, so we got the real number. And then there's also this model that the state requires you to use when you project your FTE. So we had this FTE in October that, that was new, and it was greater. I mean, we knew we, knew we were going to have more than 34,541 when they gave us the money last July. So October showed an increase. You might remember that because we got a little more money in December, you know, th for the third calculation. But we had to pick a number in December for this year. So the best the model would show us and allow us to do, and that was with us making an argument about our FTE, was 34,817. That was the number we gave them considering recalibration, considering the model at DOE, considering, 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 okay? So, what happens? Yay, at the end of the year, we come up with 35,244. Well, we're tickled to death because, and we knew we had those kids, but now they fund us at the number we gave them last December. So it's like, gee, you've lost 600 weighted FTE, we hadn't lost anything. They just, it's like we can't catch up. So when our number, when our real number comes in in October, then we'll get the money back, I guess, in December, depending on what new rules they've come up with by then. But I just want to explain that. So it, truly, this, this guessing game and projection game, it is very difficult. And why those numbers look skewed is because the model um, in Tallahassee is um, about two years behind. They told us that when we were arguing with them. They said, well, it probably is about two years behind because, you know, this is new and because CVA FTE is new and y'all are just catching up with that as it, other districts are. So, you know, my, Dr. Copeland and, and Ms. Finley, Finley have just done a marvelous job in taking what we get and giving you the budget they're going to finally revealed to you tonight. So I just had to share that. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Adams. Dr. Thank Copeland. You. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I think as Ms. Adams explained, our anticipation of that additional or the increase in during this 14, 15 year, this increase of enrollment is included in this budget. That is critical that we receive those funds um, because if we don't, mid-year we've got a problem. If for some reason the state does not pay us what we generate, and that happens all of the time, uh, so if for some reason state revenue should decline, then they would not be able to pay, pay us and they would prorate across the state what we should have received. So that, that's a critical thing we need to remember. Okay. Um, 
Can you see that? Can you read that? No, here is, no, here is an important part we need to understand. This is the fourth calculation. For 1314. We received that in April. That is for the 1314 year. This is the second calculation for 1415. So this is what we're going to receive in 1314. You can call that actual. That is what they're going to send us. In 1415, we have an increase over actual of $3.4 million. Now the question is, what was not appropriated in 1314 that we must appropriate in 1415 out of this new money. Well, as I indicated, SESPA. We have to annualize that contract, which will cost us approximately $400,000. That was not in this budget in 1314. We have estimated allocations, and uh, Ms. Adams, she can tell you why we need to estimate approximately a million dollars. I think it's primarily an ESE um, growth of uh, students, and we need to hire those teachers. That's a million dollars. That is not in this budget. The increase in retirement rate, the retirement rate increased 0.42 of 1%. That, based on our payroll, is approximately an $800,000 increase in expense that is not in this budget. There is a, we receive fund, we haven't received the funding, but we've been told, and I've accounted for it, for a digital classroom allocation of 531,000. Now, we will only receive that money if we apply for it through a grant, and I believe the date, Miss Adams, is uh, October, it October, October 1. Something. Yes. So we'll have to apply for that. If we get it, then we'll spend it on digital classrooms. Okay. Then um, the self-insurance fund. This is important for us to understand. We're self-insured when it comes to property, casualty, workers' comp, and those related expenses, not health insurance. Health insurance is paid all out of the general fund. But the self-insured fund pays for all of those costs. And so where do we get the money? I get some of it from Mr. Merrill. I get some by charging payroll for workers' comp. And then there has to be a contribution the self-insurance fund. We have sorely, yes, oh. I think we've got you a better mic All now. Right. We, yeah, it's probably me. <laughs> we, um, see. <laughs> we have. Would you like the instructions on how to hold that mic? <laughs> I need, I need anybody who wants to help me, please. Okay. What am I doing? <laughs> hello, hello, hello. It's me. Let's try okay. this one. Let's try again. Okay. <laughs> the fund balance, it's really referred to as retained earnings in the self-insured fund, is very, very low because we haven't funded it over the years. Why? So we can balance the budget in the general fund. It's caught up with us. I have to... Um, appropriate 600000 to put into that fund or they'll shut us down from a, from a self-insured fund. It has to be actuarially sound. We receive an actuarial report every year. We just completed it and they said, George, get that fund back to a certain percent. I said, give me two or three years. And other people are coming into here. They'll do a much better job, I'm sure and they will find it. I guaranteed it. So um, that's what we're going to have to do. We've got to make, start making appropriations, and that comes out of the general fund. Okay. 
So what does that leave us? Not much. 77,000. Now again, these are estimates. These are estimates on everything we do here at the beginning is an estimate. Um, but it's realistic. And so uh, there's the challenge. We get this additional revenue, but we also have to budget for expenditures that have not been appropriated in the past. 2014-15. Okay, now we're moving into the current year. We have received from the state, primarily that whole amount is FEFP, and that's 74% of our revenue. I'll skip this area. We still earn about the same amount every year in our federal. Uh, the most of the federal comes in our school food services and in federal programs. Um, local, this is primarily local property tax. Uh, and we'll review that in just one second. But our revenue, 254.4 million, is what we are estimating for 14-15. Again, as we look at the expenditures for 14-15, um, our total expense is estimated to be 252.2 million. Again, 176,000 is somewhat status quo. It's been around 175, 176. Many people ha who have retired, we have done our very best to only, to only appropriate for allocations that are absolutely critical. But if you look back uh, two or three years, employee benefits. A few years ago, it was 37 million it is now estimated to be 42 million. It, um, it's a very expensive business. Now, in this would be our health insurance, social security that we pay for the, for the employer's portion, uh, retirement, uh, it, unemployment insurance cost, these are real expenses. So, however, I'm very happy to say that based on what we understand now, we can increase that fund balance by 2.3 million. And at the end of 14-15, I'm estimating an ending fund balance of 2.57%. It's not where we want to be. Uh, there are a lot of things that can happen between now and the end of June 30, 2015 that we may not be able to control. But if, if we proceed and everything uh, works according to a budget, we're going to end up better off than we did at the end of June 30, 14. Okay, let's look quickly at our mill levies. You can see the different mill levies that we have. The critical one that you need to understand is local effort mill levy. That is set by the Department of Revenue. That is given to the Department of Ed. And in the second calculation, as you can see, we receive this mill levy. It is a general fund revenue source. Now, one interesting thing I have to tell you is that this mill levy includes an additional mill levy referred to as a prior period adjustment. In 1314, our property tax revenue fell by $1.4 million, 1.5 in that range. So when that happens, the Department of Revenue allows for a prior period adjustment that is included in the required local effort mill levy. And that adjustment is 0 .006 of a mill. A number of school districts across the state is receiving this prior period adjustment increase into their mill levy. We still have the basic discretionary levy of 0.748. There is an equalization with that mill levy, meaning that if we don't generate 
the state average per unweighted FTE, then the state will bring the difference up and pay the school districts to bring us up to that state average. And that's very nice for us. So for the, for the general fund, the total mill levy for the general fund is 5.722 mills. In Mr. Merrill's capital outlay fund is an additional mill and a half. Now you can see that back in 07, 08 and prior to that, we were at two mills. And so what they did is they took a quarter mill and bumped it up to here. You can see that quarter mill there that went into that mill levy and took it away from capital outlay. The theory was is that growth was declining and so the state said we don't need all of that money in the capital outlay fund. Let's move that mill levy a quarter mill up to the general fund. Then they did it again in 2009-10 and it's been that way since then. Okay, <clears throat> so now the critical thing is for us to determine based on those two mill levies of 4.97, really the only mill levy that determines a tax increase, is the required local effort. That is the only mill levy that determines whether or not we have to advertise for a tax increase. And that's referred to as the rollback rate, the famous rollback rate. Here we go. You all love it and you know it. <laughs> How this is calculated is that you take the 13, 14 mill levy of 5.0940 and you roll it back to the mill levy that would generate the same amount of revenue in 13, 14 for 14, 15 based on an increased assessed value. So when you increase your assessed value, you need less of a mill levy. Well, what is that less of a mill levy? That is 4.9679. So all you have to do then is say, well, state, what are you telling us our record required local effort mill levy will be for 1415? If that exceeds the rollback rate, you have a tax increase. It has nothing, we don't make that decision. It has nothing to do with you. If the mill levy for 1415 exceeds the rollback rate, you have to advertise for a tax increase, and that is the case for 1415. So our, our folks in the county need to understand that. You don't determine if there's a tax increase. We have no choice. No choice. What the Department of Revenue says our required local effort mill levy is, you compare that to the rollback rate, it, if it's greater, tax increase. If not, you don't have to advertise for a tax increase. So, that is the real purpose really tonight for, uh, for you to approve to me to go advertise these mill levies and our tentative budget for 2014-15. So, overall, our total millage levy for 14-15 is 7.222 mills. That exceeds the rollback rate in total, but that has nothing to do with whether or not we have to advertise. It is this right here only, that compared to that. But overall, we will have a 0.86% increase over the total rollback rate. Any questions? Now, how does this affect all of us? <clears throat> um, we will receive a little bit of additional revenue. In the general fund, we will receive approximately 970000 And Mr. Merrill will receive approximately 817000 So in our two funds, the general fund and the capital outlay fund, approximately a million eight. Now, what happens? is that if that falls short in the general fund, then 
in 1516, they'll also give us another prior period adjustment to try to help us with a declining property tax revenue. So if you take the mill levy, if you take a $150,000 home that's assessed at 150000 we are allowed, the school district receives 50000 in homestead exemptions. It used to be twenty five. It is now fifty. So the 100000 becomes the taxable value. When you receive your property tax bill, look at your taxable value. That will be net of homestead exemptions. And then look at the total mill levies, not only for the Clay County School District, but the other governmental entities that have mill levies also based on the Clay County School District, then it's a $12 saving. Based on the mill levy a year ago, based on the mill levy for fourteen fifteen, and based on the taxable value of 100000 If you've got a 200000 taxable value, you can do the math. All right. That is a brief overview, and now I need some help to get to the second part of this. Help? I, need a question. I have a question okay. before we Please. go further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, looking through all of this, I, uh, the first question, I guess, is more for Ms. Adams. Um, this million dollars for allocations that was a couple slides back. Um, Thank you so much. We, our allocation package was less this year than other years, so Explain to me what that million dollars is for, where these extra allocations are coming from. Dr. Copeland referenced that it was federal money or something, yes, but it's yeah, still yeah, in our budget it. there. If you'll remember um, when we gave you the allocations for um, the schools mm -hmm. and we showed a comparison of teachers and support, et cetera, remember that uh, matrix I gave you? The increase was an ESC, and it was teachers and assistants. I think there was a, I think there were, were about, I want to say it was a total increase of about 40 allocations, not all teachers, teachers and assistants. And so when we're developing the budget, we attach an, a number, a projected number to what we think that'll cost. So um, that's how we came up with that one million. That's actually funded. And that was an increase. Those were extra ESC positions over what we had this year. Yes, ma'am. But it's all paid through grant money? No. no. It's paid through, I mean, uh, those students generate weighted funding. Um, and again, um, we're being very careful as we allocate. And I, Mrs. Roth and I went back, she went back and um, analyzed class sizes once again. And um, her initial projection was based on, uh, uh, I guess, what's in the queue, so to speak, in terms of, in terms of students about to be evaluated. And um, we had a huge influx of pre-K students. I think I mentioned that. And so um, we've kind of taken the position that we are filling those positions slowly as the kids actually become eligible. So we haven't actually filled all of those positions yet. Okay. I guess the other question was, you know, back to the <coughs> salaries. Um, it's $1.2 million increase in our salaries from 13-14 school year to the 14-15. And, and then the benefits, too, which I think Dr. Copeland covered pretty well, it's 747,000 and you know it's just a concern because I know that we you have you know trimmed allocations and all and I'm a little confused as to why the salary um, there's such an increase a large increase in our salaries so I'm not sure who wants to field that you or Dr. Copeland let, let me tell well, you what we did we took every allocation that is approved for 1415 we costed them out and that's what it came to, including the additional 400000 for SESPA, including the million dollars. Um, and uh, that's basically how we did it. Now, it's an estimate, but it's based on actual for 13, 14, right. and for those returning personnel that we can cost out 
to see what it cost us. So for Ms. Uh, Adams, do we, do we have anything budgeted there for the start of the next year to meet class size, you know, every year? Oh, we, we staff to meet class size. Yes. We, we are marching toward class size. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, and, and I will tell you, um, I'm trying to remember the number. It was 258000 and some change in terms of administrative savings. cost reduction savings that we were able to trim off this year's budget. Um, Sonia and I went back and costed all of that out, so that was, that was a plus. But um, we do meet class size. Our, uh, you know, we put our money in our classrooms, and, and really that's where that increase is. And like you said, we have to budget for what we think we're going to need. So, well, thank you. I appreciate you. You're welcome. Well, uh, the other big number to note there is it was six point one million dollars that the legislature set aside for raises that could be shared between teachers, support, and administration. This board decided to put all of that in instructional personnel, so that ran our ticker up six point one million dollars in reoccurring funds, and that's the main reason that our budget didn't end up balancing at the end of the year like it did at the beginning, because this year's budget is one point two more million dollars more expensive because when we adopted the CESPA contract, um, so that's six point one, one point two, seven point three. Um, so instructional and support. Uh, cost quite a bit more than it did last year and administrators it was 258,000 Miss Adams the administrative costs went down a little over a quarter million dollars so that's where you are this year from last year okay Dr. Copeland, would you like me to proceed proceed I think here is a quick recap for all of the funds and what our budgets will be uh, for 2014-15 the general fund 252.2 million, debt service 6.6 .6 million, capital outlay projects 19.6 million, school food service 14.9, uh, contracted programs 19.1, and a small one that is being phased out, race to the top, will be completed. Actually, this is, we had a race to the top seven million or a few million dollars and it's now this is a new grant for race to the top and it's just one year at a time so um our total budget to three hundred and twelve million five hundred thousand rounded okay i'm going to go quickly i think um i don't want to wear out my welcome up here <laughs> I've reviewed those three years uh, in the executive review. Uh, there, if you are really interested in seeing where we're receiving all of our different kinds of revenue for local, state, and federal, it's there. Um, and again, I point out this, these other financing sources. You can see what that impact is, about 5.8 million of that 6.9 is coming from capital outlay. At some point, that's gonna have to end. Okay, and there is a, a quick slide on these other financing sources. So from Mr. Merrill, 5.8 million. Um, are okay, now let's just analyze it quickly. Whoops. Um, you may want to look at your books. You can see that our beginning fund balance is 7,200,000. Now, that includes um, inventory and other programs that's up and above the unassigned fund balance. It's total of everything. So our revenue, 247.5 plus 6.9 other financing sources, plus the beginning fund balance gives us 261 million hidden, uh, 261.7 million. We've estimated that our appropriations for 14-15 is 252 million. You have to add in the reserve for inventory and restricted programs, um, and that comes to 255.3. That difference then is the unassigned portion. 
that is the amount that we take as a percent of revenue and it's the 2.57 percent that we're estimating at the end of June 30, 2015. That is our goal to be there and then 15, 16 I'm sure that we can get to 3 percent. There's just a um, uh, a graph for where we get our revenue, obviously state revenue. This is 13, 14. That's, uh, no, this is 13, 14. And there's 14, 15, as you can see right there. This is proposed, and we have already reviewed that. Uh, I'm not going to do anything. Now, here's something that's interesting. You know when we start out the year, I refer to it as the second calculation. When we get down to the final, what we start out with is not always what we end up with. And um, look at these years here where we actually received less on what we started the year with. There could be a number of reasons. Declining enrollment, decrease in property tax revenues, um, not enough state revenue, so they prorate us what we were, were going to receive. And so when you get into a school year and you start seeing these declining revenues when you budget up here, it makes it very difficult. Lottery, you can see what we used to receive over the years, a great amount of lottery, and now it's down to less than 500000 Here's the schedule of our assessed value over the years. Again, the property tax mill levies, we've discussed that. Here's the rollback rate, we've discussed that. Uh, again, the review of uh, the property tax and the savings based on mill levies from one year to the next. And here is where we're spending our money. These are by object. And uh, you can see where, based on Object 100, that's all of the different categories of salaries. All of the different categories of employee benefits. And you can see the percent that, that makes up of the total budget. We're spending, and you can see there, for 12-13, that 88% was salaries and benefits. This big portion right here. 13-14. Uh, okay, that's the general fund. Any questions about that? All right, I will move faster. The next is debt service. We have three forms of debt. We have state school bonds. Those are... Um, determined at the state level. Um, how do we pay for that? We pay for that from the motor vehicle license tax. Okay? Um, we owe principal and interest $2.9 million. We've come a long way. The next form of uh, debt is through district revenue bonds. This is where we... we maybe I have it too close. Uh, this is where we... Uh, bond the revenue that comes in from um, the racetrack and highlight funds. So we receive money uh, from those revenues and we can bond that because it's pretty well guaranteed over the years, just like property tax. So we're able to bond that and Mr. Merrill can do different kinds of projects based on district revenue bonds. Of course, the largest one is certificates of participation. Those are the ones to build schools. And um, the total debt, principal and interest, is $78.9 million, almost $79 million. Uh, of that, you can see the amount for school bonds, revenue bonds, and certificates of participation. It's interesting now. I just want to make this comment on our debt is that we are able to pay the debt for our certificates of participation with impact fees. For those areas where impact fees are charged, 
and where a school is built because of those impact fees. As you go through the amortization schedule, and it's the end of this tab in Fund 200, where you can see the amortization schedule for those COPs, as we get out near the end, some of those payments become large, very large. And Mr. Merrill will be relying on those impact fees to pay the debt service for a couple of those schools that were built into those areas where impact fees are levied. So I know the, I understand the situation about getting rid of, rid of impact fees. We understand that, but we rely on that heavily and we rely on it heavier as we get to latter years of paying the debt for our COPs. Now, at any time where there is a significant savings, we will refinance those COPs. We do it every two or three years. You cannot refinance a COP until it's been active for 10 years. So 2004 COP, 2014, it did not create enough savings for us. We have a, two, we have a 2005 A and B COP, Certificate of Participation. Next year, in February or March, someone will need to determine if there is a tax savings, and if there is, we'll do it. And basically, in these latter years, the interest rates are much higher because they didn't know what the interest rate would be for 10, 12 years out, so they make them higher. And if the current rate is less than that, you can refinance them and save a lot of money. Dr. Copeland. Ma'am. We're getting, what, a, a, this year about $5 million in impact fees? Correct. Okay, and what a lot of people don't understand, I know there's a lot of people who say, just get rid of those impact fees, and you know, there's probably none of us who wouldn't like to be able to get rid of impact fees, but when we had the heavy growth years, and we were building schools to house children who were moving into the county, we didn't have the money to build the schools, so we borrowed the money. And so now, believe it or not, we have to pay for them. And the only way we have to pay for them is from the money coming in from impact fees. So we're kind of, you know, we, we have a lot of um, people who are saying you really need to get rid of those, but um, we've got, uh, in the COPs, I think our debt's down to 72 million, and I believe it used to be 100 million. It did. And we are, you know, we're making headway slowly but surely but as much as it would be nice to sit and tell a builder or developer or someone that we would love to get rid of those impact fees somebody has to pay that debt right and uh, so is there anywhere else we could get the money to pay that debt dr copeland if they were to increase the mill levy back to two mills mr merrill would then be able to take more out of out of the two mills to pay the debt and not need impact fees. But just like the, when they went, reduced it, the 2.0 mill, and they put the 0.25 up there, it lasted, what, two years? And then it went away. Right. So, you know, we, we just haven't caught a break yet. No, ma'am. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Copeland. Here's a quick uh, chart that shows where the different principal and interest is for those three types of debt. Um, I, I this isn't necessary for me to go through. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Merrill, and he can take uh, a minute. And then I'll turn it to Ms. Glover. And then I'll take five minutes after that, and we're done. Okay. Very good. Mr. Merrill, welcome. Mr. Merrill. Thank you. For you who haven't uh, seen this gentleman before, this is John Merrill. He is the new assistant superintendent for support services. You want me to get out of your way? Yeah. Okay, this is a test, Mr. Merrill. <laughs> well, Madam Chairman, members of the board, thank you. Good evening. Uh, somebody more technologically smart than me can. <laughs> Turn this one on. He's worse than I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
They're not in our technology and department, that is, for the, sure. that is the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> oh. I, I was going through uh, Dr. Copeland's book, and uh, his, his numbers and my numbers don't agree. I think he's got some late-breaking numbers that I don't have, but they will be by the, top, by the time the final book okay, comes through. Okay, very they good. Will, uh, they will agree. Okay. I gave you a, each of you a, a colored copy of the, uh, of the educational facilities plan to help you uh, follow a little bit more closely. It's the same plan you've seen for several years. Uh, the the format's the same. Uh, just the numbers have changed. It's still divided into four sections, planning, maintenance, and transportation, capital outlay plans, and the five-year uh, work program. Uh, the planning section, uh, it seems like uh, every section in the DOE has its own estimators. Uh, the numbers I have to use from DOE are different than the numbers Dr. Copeland gets. Uh, so they each, they've each got their own gurus on estimating how, it, how much is going to be, uh, how many kids are going to be in the schools. And uh, but we're in the facilities section, are required to go with what uh, the facilities folks provide us. Uh, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, if you take a look at page two, this is the facilities projection from, uh, from DOE that we have to go by. Uh, there's projecting that we have uh, 34,616 uh, children next year. Uh, if you look down at the, uh, the bottom, uh, you'll see how their projections are going, and you can see that uh, pretty much they're projecting stagnant growth for us. Uh, maximum increase of about 95, maximum decrease of 89, and at the end of five years, we've only changed our enrollment by uh, 47 kids. So pretty, pretty slow, pretty stagnant growth, even out to the 10 year period. Which means we don't anticipate building any new schools for the next 10 years. However, we do have new school sites that, uh, that uh, as I understand, we own, and they're on page six. We got uh, two elementary schools, uh, one in the uh, Green Cove Springs area off 315, uh, an elementary school in the South Oak Leaf area, and a junior high school in the Fleming Island High area for those impacts of areas of growth. That brings us to the uh, uh, school uh, capacity charts. Uh, on page nine starts the school capacity charts. Uh, school capacity and level of service is determined one of two ways. It's Mr. Depend. Merrill, let me stop you for a minute. Sure. Um, you talked about the three sites, the properties that we have for schools that have not been. What happened with the Fleming Island High, uh, Fleming Island Junior High property? Didn't we just have an agreement on that till 2016, or what? What year is that? You've got 2024 on here. That's when we'd anticipate building a new school in that area. The the growth just isn't there right now to and to to build one right now. Dr. Copeland, do you remember what I'm what I'm referencing? Um, that property had an agreement, a contract only through 2000, either 15 or 16. I think we've, d we've uh, dispersed that, and uh -huh. we don't have that property. No, we do. We do? We do have that property, yes. Well, then must be Did we extend the contract? Do you know, Mr. Merrill? I don't know, but I'll, I'll check and get back with you on that. Madam Chairman. Yes, Mr. Uh, Pickner. If I may, the, what that is is part of the original, um, gosh, I can't remember what you call it, when they, when they created that, Fleming Island Plantation and Eagle Harbor. There's land that was deeded 40 acres for a junior high school. One of the terms of that development agreement is that if we have not begun to build. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bickner. Uh, Ms. Bobine, would you close the door? The, there's several, the superintendent and several gentlemen are having a conversation and it's disrupting the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Bobine. All right, Mr. Bittner, continue. The development agreement says that if we have not begun construction on that piece of property for a junior high school by March of 2015, I believe is the date. I'd have to go back and look, but it's within that range, 2000, March or April, somewhere in that range. Then the, the developer can buy that piece of property back at $25,000 an acre. It's May, not, it doesn't require approval. Uh, that's been brought up. I brought it up to Mike Elliott several years ago. I most recently brought it up to um, Jim Connell, and it's been brought up uh, at, for staff. The idea being that we need to go back to the developer and reach an agreement to extend that 
for a period of time. Either that or figure out what we have to do to begin breaking ground. Because we don't, we don't have any plans to build a school, I believe I read, for 10 years. Yes, and uh, we certainly don't want to lose that property because we certainly want to have that available for a junior high school on Fleming Island. It, it will be needed, but we certainly we need to make sure we don't lose that property. Let, let me get real smart real quick with Mr. Bickner. That, okay. That's, that's, Thank you. That time's coming up okay. pretty quick. You. Okay. Be here before Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Uh, the, uh, the school capacity uh, charts start on uh, uh, page 9. If you take a look at uh, level of service and school capacity is determined either by the fish capacity, which is the number of total seats in the school, or the core capacity, which is the cafeteria capacity. Uh, whatever is less is the the fish level of service or the level of service for the school. The, uh, the schools that are highlighted in yellow on the left are core capacity level of service schools. The, uh, the capacity is determined by the cafeteria uh, size. Uh, the school board has determined that uh, we should not be over 110% level of service. And for the next five years, we're not close to that. We do have two elementary schools. Charles E. Bennett and Dr. Zinlet that are over 100%, but not close to 110. Uh, we're keeping an eye on those, and those two, again, are core capacity due to the cafeteria. Uh, as you go from years 5 to 10, we get a few more schools over 100%, but again, nothing uh, close to 110% that we can't manage. Uh, as we uh, go through the, the plan, uh, the next sections are uh, maintenance and capital outlay projects. And uh, as Dr. Copeland has said, uh, we, uh, right now we've had no PICO funds from the state uh, for the past four years, but I see in his book he anticipates possibly $700,000 this year. Really? If that, if that comes through, that'll be great. That'll give us some breathing room. Huh. Uh, so right now I'm not counting on it. Uh, <laughs> but we'll go from there. We'll believe it when we see it. Huh? Yeah. Uh, the uh, maintenance projects are lean. Uh, they're enough to keep the schools operational, keep them functional, replace high time equipment that is, uh, that is at the end of its useful life, and uh, keep, the, uh, keep the schools running. Uh, pretty's not a priority. If, it, uh, you know, if it's just cosmetic changes we're doing, we're not going to be doing those. We're going to be doing the, uh, the essentials to, uh, to keep the schools running and up and operational and safe. That's on uh, page 13 and 14. Uh, the next is transportation and equipment. Uh, last year, uh, Robert and the transportation department uh, took a bullet and didn't fund any buses. Their plan is not any new growth, but to replace 10% of their fleet each year. Last year, they, they didn't replace any. Uh, I didn't want to put them in that position again, so we found some money for them, and uh, about a third of what they really need, but it keeps them heading in the right direction, so they're going to be replacing nine buses uh, this year uh, out of the budget. The capital outlay plan is next, and uh, Dr. Copeland uh, talked about some of the, uh, the sources of revenue. On page 17, we got PICO, uh, which comes from gross tax receipts from the state. Again, we haven't had any PICO maintenance for the past three years, possibly four years coming up, the 1.5 mil levy, uh, the uh, local option sales tax, impact fees, certificates of participation, capital outlay, and debt service. Uh, all these sources of revenue are great, but they all have strings attached to them. They all have requirements that you've got to meet before you can expend any of these funds. And the, the ones that are the strictest are the uh, uh, impact fees. Uh, we, we're really restricted on what we can spend impact fees for. On page 19, you'll see a, sort of a summary of a, where our revenue is coming from. Uh, and it looks like we should have about $20.5 million uh, from all those sources. Page 20 is, the, uh, is where it goes, uh, real quick. Uh, you see the first on the certificates of participation, Dr. Copeland mentioned uh, impact fees. We can only spend impact fees on schools that we built after 2003 and that were in the area of growth. So those first three, un those first three line items, Oak Leaf Junior High School, Oak Leaf High School, Lake Asbury Junior High, we're paying the debt on those with impact fees. Those are the only schools that we can use impact fees for. The remaining three items, Ridgeview High School and Fleming on High, we're paying out of the 1.5 mil money uh, to pay their debt. We've got the school bus purchase, 
district-wide equipment insurance that Dr. Copeland talked about, uh, technology, uh, the maintenance department, we uh, transferred $900 for them to keep the schools running, and then the, uh, the two and a half million reclass for salaries that, uh, again, Dr. Copeland mentioned. The next page is, uh, two pages, is the projects that we anticipate doing in the facilities world. Again, there's not any big sexy projects like uh, new buildings or renovations of uh, cafeterias or media centers or anything like that. Again, they're, they're bare bones, keep the schools running, keep them operational, keep them safe. And uh, we've got several of those that, uh, that will help do that. And I had a slide, but you can't see it. If you look in the lower left-hand corner of that uh, thing that you really can't read, it looks like the only money after our revenues, after our expenses, it looks like we have about $9.5 million that we're going to roll forward. All of that $9.5 million is impact fee money. So it looks like it's a lot of money that we should be able to use, but in fact it really isn't. All we can use it is to pay the debt on those three schools over the top. In Becky Smith in our department, we were talking about this, and as Dr. Copeland said, you know, it looks like, you know, we got nine million dollars. We had a lot of impact fees, but she's costed it out through the uh, the years. We've got to use it within six years, or it's it's up for refund. Twenty six, twenty seven, year two thousand twenty six, twenty seven is when we finally hit that point where we would be using impact fees that are older than six years old. So. Until now and then, between now and 2026, 27, we're able, if we get $5 million a year, we're able to continue to pay off that debt, serve, that debt for those schools and still remain within that six-year window of using impact fees. Okay. So as Dr. Copeland said, they are critical uh, for maintenance and uh, to take care of those schools that we've built. In the last page is the uh, uh, five-year work program. Uh, this is basically a, a rehash or a recondensing in the DOE website database of the of the things we just talked about. That database isn't open yet uh, to be input. The beginning of next month it will be, and uh, then we'll start inputting that, and it will be part of the final plan that comes to you for approval. You any questions? I have one. Yes. Um, back on page 21, um, the very last item on the left, it's a KHE gymnasium restoration because I've been working with a young man that's been very interested in that. And is that part of that little plan that? Uh, yes, ma'am. We're going to probably have, exactly to, have to phase that over a couple of years. Okay. But uh, we're going to try to get that up and looking good and, and running and, and more functional than it is right now. Okay, thank uh, you. So. I didn't know if it, I know one of the problems was the, um, um, was the handicap accessible restrooms. Is that's, that part of that deal? Yes. Well, it's going to, we're going to be looking with the uh, the, arch, or the architect uh, now that the uh, contracts have been approved this this year for, or this uh, for this next upcoming year at this board meeting. We'll be getting with the architect down there and, and walking through that and see exactly what we can do according to code. Uh, if we bring those two restrooms that are in there now up to handicap accessible, I guarantee you they're going to be down to just a single person use. Right. Uh, and whether we can do that for a gym or not, whether the, uh, the you have to have so much restroom capacity in a gym, that's going to be something we have to talk to code and the, and the architect about. But our desire is to bring those up to, uh, up to code. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Any other thank questions? You. Anything else for Mr. Merrill? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Dr. Copeland, are you coming back? I might have Ms. Glover come up and okay. she'll review that. And then after that, we can be done in two minutes. Okay. Very good. Ms. Glover. Food services.
Good evening and thank you for having me. It's been another very busy and successful year. For the 2013-2014 school year, I'm proud to report to you that over 4.4 million meals were served to the students of Clay County. That equates to around 25,000 meals per day with a participation rate of 69%. So needless to say, our ladies and gentlemen are working very hard on the front lines to prepare and serve so many meals. The Healthy Hunger Free Cat Kids Act, excuse me, implementation has created some financial and training challenges for us. We have worked hard behind the scenes to ensure adequate training for all our cafeteria management and assistance on the new meal pattern mandates. We have also worked hard to ensure food products that have been converted to whole grain and contain less sodium still taste good and are pleasing to the eye. Over the past two years, we have overcome these challenges as we still maintain consistent student participation and a cost-effective program. I'm happy to say that we will, we will not have to raise meal prices again this year because of our strong financial position and our continued compliance with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, we are exempt from the paid lunch equity provision for the 2014-2015 school year. Smart Snacks in Schools. I like to call Smart Snacks in Schools the second phase of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. The first phase was focused on improving the nutritional component of the reimbursable meal. The second phase will now focus on a la carte sales. A la carte sales being food items we do not receive federal reimbursement for. The Smart Snacks in Schools sets very strict guidelines for calories, sodium, fat, and sugar. They also set strict limits on beverages that are not sold as part of the reimbursable meal. So what does this mean for Clay County? Our popular basket combo type items that have been sold to our junior and senior high schools will be eliminated as they are now considered snack items. The only change in our elementary schools will be the elimination of our low calorie G2 Gatorade. Water and 100% juice will be the only beverages allowed to be sold a la carte in both our elementary and junior high schools. Districts around the United States are bracing for the expected loss in revenue generated by a la carte sales. We feel confident the students who have been purchasing a la carte baskets will continue to participate in our program by purchasing a reimbursable meal. For the 2014-2015 school year, we will continue to exceed the standards and serve fresh whole fruit at both breakfast and lunch. We will also incorporate fresh seasonal vegetables that have never been served before in Clay County, like squash and zucchini. Clay County is one of the few surrounding counties still making made from scratch rolls and dessert items. We will continue to develop more homemade entrees and side items as well. Our summer feeding program is in full swing. We have six open sites and one VPK site. In addition, we are also providing meals for two Bright Mind camps at Bannerman Learning Center and Thomas Hogan Memorial Gym. The first week of our summer feeding program, we fed over 3,700 children. In our second week, we fed over 4,100 children. Our second annual summer feeding bus is also in full swing. This year, due to construction at both Keystone Heights High School and Keystone Elementary, we were not able to host an open summer feeding site in the Keystone area. So we thought, why not send our bus to Keystone? 
This has turned out to be very beneficial. Not only are we serving the community, but we are also spreading the word about our summer feeding program and representing Clay County Schools in a positive way. I always like to say that we're more than just hamburgers and hot dogs. It's important to our team that we are part of the educational process and do our best to promote not only nutritional events, but educational events as well. A few scheduled events for this year are the 100th Day of School, Literacy Week, Cinco de Mayo, Delicious Discoverers, National Heart Health Month, and our 13th Annual Nutrition and Exercise Challenge. This year, our Nutrition and Exercise Challenge will be extended to our food service employees. A few pictures for our 100th Day of School promotion. This is our cafeteria manager, April Chismark. The staff at McRae did a fantastic job. They displayed food items in groups of 100. Here they use milk cartons, oranges, apples, and condiment packets to show groups of 100. This promotion is a great opportunity to have fun and provide the students with a positive learning environment. And a few pictures of our lucky winners of our 12th annual nutrition and exercise challenge. We gave away a brand new Huffy bike at all of our elementary schools for the grand prize winner of that challenge. And here's a picture of our um, cafeteria staff at Fleming Island High School gearing up for Spirit Day to help kick off high school football season. And just a small collage of pictures of our hardworking team that helps make it all happen. The Food Nutrition Services Department strives to raise the bar, maintaining high standards of sanitation, customer service, and quality meals for the students of Clay County. We will continue to give 100%. So. Any questions for Ms. Glover? We, we just want to congratulate you. We, don't get any complaints about our cafeterias and y'all you. Uh, you do an excellent job thank you we have a great team and have a great team around me so thank you mr. Van Zant said he wants to know when they're having squash and zucchini because he wants to be sure and be it there will be seasonal I'll let you know <laughs> you call me when you make those homemade white yeast rolls that, you know you're all 100% whole wheat now but when you make the nice fluffy white ones yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those <laughs> thank you thank you all right. Okay, Dr. Copeland, you said two minutes, right? Okay. Hang on, folks. We're thank, almost there. Thank you, Susie. I don't think I'm going to throw any more up there. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I, I get, I get um, she does a great job. The leadership she certainly does. is fantastic, and that department is wonderful. Next is the. Um, other federal programs, which I kind of touched upon, primarily uh, IDEA and Title I. Uh, we, we basically spend what we get each year. Goes for um, salaries, benefits, supplies, that type of thing. Next would be the self-insurance fund. Uh, we've talked about that. So uh, that's it, Madam Chairman. Um, if, there, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and address them. If not, I will need a motion to approve that I advertise the 2014-15 tentative budget and millages and then to set the date uh, to adopt the final budget. We must do that by September the 18th. Under trim, we have 84 days starting July 1. We haven't set that date yet? No, ma'am, we haven't. Okay. I, we've, I've recommended the 18th of September. That is a board night. It's the third Thursday of the month. We cannot go past that. Uh, so my recommendation is that we do it on a board night, the 18th. The only problem is that is the final date to adopt the final budget. We must do it. You have, you have 63 days at a minimum and 84 at a maximum. Have we ever done it before the last day? We like have, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we have done it uh, really any time after September 4th or 5th when that minimum number of days. Okay. So it's up to you. 
And we always do it, um, we have to do it after 5 o'clock, okay. even for the tentative budget. Now, we need, also need to set the date for that. And the final date we can do the tentative budget, when I advertise on the 24th, a week from today, we must do it within five days. You can't do it within two, and you cannot exceed five. So the 29th of July mm -hmm. is the recommended time to adopt the tentative budget. And, and we, we have 515 adopt. That it must be after five o'clock. It can be later. We had 515 set. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. But, uh, but we don't know where. Did we know where? Did do y'all? Here. Right here. Is it here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 515. So, uh, on the 29th to adopt the tentative budget right. that we are advertising on the 24th, so correct? Mr. Bigner, we will need a motion to approve that these, the tentative budget be advertised, set the, and the millages, and to set the final date for, for whatever. All right, let me ask the board, do you want to approve the final budget at the regular September board meeting? Or, I mean, you feel comfortable we'll all be here? I, there's no reason yeah. not, rather than having a special meeting to yeah. do that. Okay. We'll just do it on the uh, 18th of September uh, at our regular Perfect. third Thursday board meeting. Does that, that sound work. good? Okay. I, I gave you a copy of the handout of the uh, advertisements that I will take to the paper on Monday morning. Okay. And how do you want, let's see advertisement for 2014 so we don't have to give numbers we just say no. approve this paperwork that you gave us with all the formal advertising Are you comfortable on with it? that mr bigner well you're saying that you need a motion to approve the advertisement of the 2014-15 tentative budget and millages as presented tonight that's okay. that sounds good and to set the final date to set the final date uh, the date for the f to adopt the final budget September the 18th at 7 okay. p.m. so, that so I'll, be, uh, you so want that a motion, be your motion the... just as I gave it to you all right I'll, I'll move the motion motion to approve Thank you. second I have a motion by Miss McKinnon a second by Miss Graham any discussion all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye aye all opposed say no motion carries 5-0 dr. Copeland before you leave um, before we adopt the final budget on uh, September the 18th, yes, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask the board: Do y'all want to have a budget workshop to really go over this? Um, do you think it would help, Dr. Copeland? Uh, uh, once you get, we get before we adopt that final budget. The way the process works is that we adopt the tentative budget on the 29th of this month. Right. We go gather more information, try to refine what we have up through the end of August. When August 30th comes, that is the cutoff date. And the, what information we have at that point, I prepare the final budget, okay. which I deliver to you on the 18th. If the board would like a workshop to review that information, uh, it's your call, but we it would probably be more meaningful to do it like on the 7th or 8th of September. I don't know if those days are, is, I, I'm just recommending that. Well, the 7th the is a Sunday, no. Okay. The uh, 8th is a Monday. How about Tuesday the 9th? Suits me. What, what are you? I'm on vacation. You're, you're all away that, or that whole week? Two weeks. Two weeks. Well, you can't go on vacation. Well, my husband. <laughs> what about the, um, let's see, what about, let's see. About the um, August 28th. Dr. Copeland would, going back, well, let's see, we've got Labor Day week, let's see, the 28th. What about Thursday, the 28th of August? That'll work. I, you How know. about, with, it's in the afternoon. Okay. What about you, Ms. Graham, Ms. Yeah. Bullock? August 28th. What day is that? It's a Thursday. Okay. And what time is, would you board members like to do a workshop, budget workshop? 5, 5.30. 5, 5.30. 5, 5, 5, 5, somewhere like that. What do you prefer, 5 or 5.30? 5. 5. Is that good for everybody? 5, 5 p.m.? Yes, ma'am. And, and I think... 
really the, the main thing that we may want to review would just be the general fund. Okay. These other funds yeah. are pretty well set. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Would it be okay if we just center on the, right. on the general fund? Okay. And is this what room available? Okay, they're, no. they're checking. What date did you say? It's uh, th August the 28th, a Thursday at 5 o'clock. She, Ms. Bush, is she checking the, okay. Well, if, if, five o'clock? Wonderful, we're, we're good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Copeland. I just want to say one thing. I must give a big thank you to Superintendent, Ms. Adams, senior staff, and my staff, primarily Sonia Finley. I could not do it without that group, and especially Sonia. Sonia is my right and left hand. So it's a lot of work, but a lot of people are involved. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank Copeland. For those of you that don't know, Dr. Copeland and Ms. Finley are pretty much there every day through the summer, 4th of July, Sunday after church, just in, out, in, out, doing all this. It's 4th of July. was time of the year. Counting. Um, I have been requested by the board to. Did we finish with all of this, the rollback and, and all of that? We finished with everything, didn't we, Dr. Yeah. Cope? We're done. We did. We've already voted. We're done. It's just the one that we didn't have to do. We'll be separate. advertising. The others increase. were just for review. Okay. okay. So the board members would like to have a 10 minute break. And so if the audience, I appreciate you sitting through this budget presentation. When you get back, we will get to the rest of the business of the board, 10 minutes. less behavior that is wanted or needed in this school district. You are damaging our county, our administrators, our teachers, our families, and most importantly, setting a poor example for the precious children who attend our schools, not to mention making you appear very foolish. Thank you. And Brenda Kicksack. Good evening, my name is Brenda Kishak. I live on Raggedy Point Road in Fleming Island. I want to address a few issues, some that have been going on for a long time and others which have come about recently. I guess I can truly say that few things surprise me any more as it pertains to this board and that certainly pertains to tonight. However, when Dr. Henry shared his comments last month, he had my full and undivided attention. As he spoke of the dysfunctional relationship between you, the board, and the superintendent, I was reminded of several incidents that have played out in the last couple of years, one of which is policy revisions. I looked back over a number of years and saw that previous revisions were typically introduced by staff or the superintendent. 
but over the last year or so, a few have been brought up by school board members. One is the 2.03 revision passed by a 3-2 vote in September of 2013. This was a clear example of not working together cohesively. After the superintendent, fellow board members, and numerous staff members offered their concerns, you took no measures to work together on the language to gain consensus. One staff member last year mentioned a concern of unintended consequences. Perhaps it was those consequences which led to the HR issue last month and the additional meeting you scheduled due to your reluctance to listen to reason. Most recently, you changed policy to shift authority from the superintendent to you, the chair. Tonight, we see what the result of that is. Each of the three scheduled citizens had a right to address this board, but on the first month, you have the quote unquote final say, all three of them were denied. These revisions are just one problem from a host of issues and they have done nothing to help this district run more efficiently, assist teachers with their ever increasing demands, nor do they lead to greater student achievement. I've seen that they fulfill your desire for more control and power. I would have liked to see an agenda item tonight that indicated you heard Dr. Henry's formal warning loud and clear. Please consider watching his comments again and heed the warning. I will choose to close on a high note because I am thankful for teachers, students, and many others in the district who do step up to the plate, give their best, and press on without regard to what happens here. My daughter was privileged to go to Clay High this week to participate in a cheer camp. The cheerleaders did a fabulous job giving them a wonderful week, and I would just like to say that Clay is a superior county, and we deserve to have our great reputation back. Please work as hard here. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Stanley Finning. Can I make a joke for a few seconds? 15 seconds. Make a joke, and then we'll start your time. Okay. I'm wearing uh, down. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wave the 15 seconds, because what you can do is, is think about this. It's not very funny that I've talked to no less than three attorneys this week who are in good standing with the Florida Bar. And they all reached consensus, separate and independent of each other, that my First Amendment rights had been violated and that the school board policy was met. I'm going to pick one of those three attorneys. I'm going to file a lawsuit against the school board. It's not funny. I've been very patient with you, Mrs. Studdard. Now, I don't know if you're playing hard to get, but maybe that's funny. Okay, I'll take my 15 seconds back. But for some reason, for some reason, you might think it's funny that your husband stood at this podium for 10 minutes and read the riot uh, act. Mr. Finning, you know. It's my three minutes, right? Yeah, but, yeah, but you know, we have to be, uh, have some sense of decorum in this meeting. Uh, we are trying to do the business of the school board. Uh, telling me I'm playing hard to get, or as you put on Facebook, do you think she's sweet on me? Um, that has that? nothing to do with educating the students in Clay County. Uh, I would prefer if you talk about speech, things that will help our protect. school system, not try to come and start a personal confrontation with me every month. I would appreciate it if you would talk about something dealing with education. Yes, Thank you. The education starts with the First Amendment, okay? You violated it. You violated Sunshine. You, you don't have to trust me. I don't know nothing. I'm just old hillbilly from Clay Hill. But the First Amendment Foundation has looked at each and every time you've ejected me, Mrs. Studdard, and they watched your husband for 10 minutes you talk about nothing to do with school board business. You are in a position of public trust, you have abused that trust. 
You're done abusing your public power. You are on notice. Fair warning that there's a lawsuit coming. Okay. And you wanna do you wanna discuss that civilly and come to a reasonable remedy? Because I have options available. I'm willing to I'm willing to accept your resignation and call it even. Forty seconds, I'll share that with you. You're not going to resign? You think it's funny? Do you think I'm kidding? One iota. Okay, I've you got may 30 sit down. seconds left. No, ma'am, that, no, that, that was the red light. You that must was, sit down, no, Mr. That was, you said when that thing chirps like that, I've got 30 seconds left, 27 seconds and counting. I'll give you that time. All right. How many seconds does he have left? 30, but I can't, I can't All right, we're going to give you 30 seconds. I'll go by my watch. Go. Okay. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to reconsider. I'm not joking. This isn't funny. I'm a reasonable man. Okay. Thank you, you. You're thank you for your thank you for your consideration. Okay. We'll Superintendent request. School board request. So attorney request. Did, did somebody else have a card out there? Oh, good lord! I got too excited here. Oh, got to Mr. Gottschalk. I'm sorry. Uh, you did have a card in. Uh, it's your turn. You're the last speaker. Two cards. Didn't you speak under presentations from the audience? I put in three cards. We can, you have one three-minute card under presentations from the audience. That's all that you're allowed. Did you speak under presentations from the audience? Let me find this card. Go ahead, Mr. Gottschalk, while I look for the card, okay? Ms. Sutter, I'm going to save you the trouble. You're not going to have to shut me up. <laughs> That's better than the light that shined in our face, I think. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. He talked about the appointment. Mr. Yeldell, um, you had a card filled out on the uh, appointment of the superintendent. Uh, you filled out a card on number 41, which was stricken from the agenda, and you had a card out on 41, which was stricken from the agenda. I have no card for you on presentations from the audience. If you'll note, the second card on number 41 was put in under the final section of the agenda, which is for things that are no longer on the agenda. It says citizen request. That is neither under C nor D. It's under, it's under presentations. Did you mean presentations from the audience? Yeah. We don't yes. call these citizens request. Okay. Okay. We don't do citizens request. No, the first he, part He's got scheduled citizens request. You have, he's got item number 41. We don't take green cards on those. And we're, on, we're at the end of the meeting under presentations from the audience. So you're going to deny me twice in the same meeting a chance to speak to the Well, board. I'm just, just going by what you wrote on the card. It's your handwriting, not mine. Just to be clear, you're not going to let me speak twice in the same meeting, even though <laughs> I did follow the procedure for no, first. No, you, you can speak twice in an evening, but you fill out a card for presentations from the audience, and you filled out a card on the D3, and then you filled out two cards on 41. No, I filled out one card to speak when number 41 was to be 
addressed. It was stricken completely, so I was instructed to fill out a second card to speak at the end of the meeting, which is what I attempted to do. Oh, and someone accidentally called it citizen's request yes. because they didn't know the proper name for it. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Yeldell, I'm going to, let's see, Mr. Gottschalk got to speak. I'm going to uh, uh, bend it. I'm going to give you your three minutes because I think you legitimately wanted the presentations from the audience. And so next time you'll know what to call it. Are okay, you start is three minutes. Again, my name is still Gary Yeldell. <laughs> I still reside in Clay County on Alderman Road. And believe it or not, despite that last interchange, the reason I'm standing here is to actually thank you. When I found out, when it became public that I had been stricken from the agenda along with two other citizens that had satisfied board policy to have their 10 minutes, uh, I was encouraged by a number of folks to come and rant and rave and jump up and down and explain why it was an illegal action. I did choose not to do that because I realized something, something quite remarkable, that I did owe you a thanks. Because in your unilateral action to abuse your newfound policy, to strike all three of us from the meeting agenda, you spoke far more and far more eloquently than I ever could in 10 minutes. In that single action, you communicated more clearly than I ever could how cheaply you value citizen input, how cheaply you value us as the rank and file members of society that elect the members of this board. So I thank you for that. I also thank you for actually, without knowing it, proving me right. I stood here one month ago and explained why the revisions to policy 1.02 were a bad idea. Specifically, I mentioned how the revisions, the double revision actually, didn't protect this board or us from any abuse. All it did was change who got to abuse agenda setting power. When I spoke those words, I had no idea that I'd be back one month later, not talking about my warning, but living my warning. So thank you for proving me right. What's done is done tonight, and the voters will speak through the ballot box, and I have very little doubt that it will have the same fate as it did in 92 when it was done the first time. But the reason I'm thanking you is because you did a far better job than I ever could to explain to the electorate who will speak in the ballot box, both this election and next, exactly where you stand and where we stand in your eyes. Thank you. Okay, and now we've got school board request. Anything? No. Attorney request? The meeting is adjourned. Test, test. We didn't mute the microphone, did we? Yeah, that was just switched. So that one's
Yeah, then, then that, that, that would be something. is almost similar to mine. Let me show you. Let me show you. No, mine's mine's not. at like 12 o'clock and then didn't eat anything when I came over here. Did you get a minute? She's right there. She's right there. Yeah. Ladies, whoops, I don't have any, I don't have any juice. Ladies, no. They're coming.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll be seated, we'll resume the uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I think the 10 minute break and getting to walk around a little bit helped us all. All right, next uh, we have the superintendent's update. I'll, I'll be brief as the hour is getting late, but I'm updated you last month on our FCAT scores. Our elementary and junior high school grades came in last week, had 11 schools improved from either a B or a C to an A. So uh, thank you uh, to our instructional staff and everybody that supports that effort. Uh, we've been focused on a very few things, but been trying to work on them very diligently and uh, starting to pay off. So thank you for the administrators that are here tonight that are leading that charge. And uh, we'll have our high school grades out in December. And the other item I have, ma'am, one of you fine ladies needs to nominate another one of you to serve on the value adjustment board. That's the next item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Van Zandt. Okay, uh, item D2, appoint one board member and one private citizen to serve a one-year term on the Value Adjustment Board for a one-year term beginning August 1st, 2014 and ending July 31st, 2015. This past year, Ms. McKinnon served on the Value Adjustment Board and I believe the uh, citizen was Scott Roberts yes. from Keystone. Um, well, I think the first thing I will do is ask if there's a volunteer to serve on the Value Adjustment Board from this board for the next year. How many times did you meet Ms. McKinnon? We actually only met twice. Yeah, because they've done, they're doing it a little bit different than yeah. they used to years ago. So does anyone want to, you did it two years ago? The way, I, yeah. I don't oh, mind doing Lisa, it again. If I don't mind doing it again, it wasn't really anything major. Y'all want to, that, that's fine with me. Okay. I'll nominate Good. Ms. McKinnon. Okay, we Second. nominate Ms. McKinnon. We have a motion. Second. Have a motion by Ms. Uh, Kirikas, second by Ms. Bullock. We're not going to have any discussion and we're going <laughs> to vote. <laughs> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Now, has anyone talked to Mr. Roberts to see if he wants to continue on? I haven't, but I Or do, do you have any idea? <laughs> Mr. Van Zandt said that he's sure Mr. Roberts will want yes, to continue on. And if he doesn't, um, I guess you can let us know and we'll we'll find someone. Okay. Uh, next. Do we have to appoint? We need a motion and a second on that as well. Oh, and a motion and a second. All right. Uh, let's make a motion and then if he won't do it, then we'll have to, to worry about it. <laughs> All right. I'll entertain a motion on uh, the citizen member. I'll second. Who made the motion? Motion by Ms. Graham, second by Ms. McKinnon. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All, all opposed, no. Motion carries 5-0. Now, next, uh, approve resolution to place the question of appointment versus election of superintendent of schools on the November 2014 election ballot. Um, I had placed this item on the agenda. Do we need a motion first? Uh, I'll move approval. Well. We need to motion going, in a second to, to I'm gonna, discuss it. We've got an hour green cards, oh so we have an hour's worth of green cards. So I thought I would let them speak, but then we'd get a motion. You're not even close, Miss Caracas. Wow. <laughs> I'm looking at that stack of cards. <laughs> I'm glad we had a break while ago. That's right. Okay. I think I counted 20 or 21. That's, you know. Okay. These are the green cards. Each person has three minutes to speak. And uh, Ms. Bush, is, are the lights working properly tonight? Okay. Because we had a problem last month. Okay. First card is Ronnie Robinson. Hello, appreciate the time. My name is Ronnie E. Robinson, address 464 Lake Asbury Drive. Um, I didn't come with any prepared statements. I was looking at, uh, I find it interesting that we would want to take the out of the citizens' hand to vote their 
vote for their own superintendent. I was looking at this right up here where it says neighboring St. John's County School District is one of the top ranked schools statewide and they have an appointed superintendent. But Clay County is also one of the top rated school districts in the state and I think that we rank, I'm, I'm may not be completely accurate on this, but I want to think that we rank above about 50 some odd counties that are appointed superintendents and we have an elected one. So I'd say that's a big percentage difference. I wouldn't even consider in this Duval County being an appointed superintendent with the problems they have in Duval County and I grew up in West Jackson well. One other thing that ties in with this, I'm not going to mention any names, but I, I'll watch quite a few of your meetings. I come to quite a few of them. And what I really don't understand is why we can't work a little more together. I'm not going to mention any names. But if the BCC interfered with the daily operation of the county manager to the length of what's done at the superintendent schools, the BCC would not get anything done. Uh, I think the BCC's job, of course, is to set legislative items and what have you. The superintendent's job is to run the day-to-day -day operation of the schools. Uh, it seems like every time I pick up the paper and read, we're changing a job description, which have been around for a long time, but uh, all of a sudden they're not good enough. I don't have a lot to say other than the last time this came up, this was defeated by 71% of the people in Clay County. I think it's very dangerous to have where you have four or five people that very well may not think the way that the majority of Clay County citizens think when it comes to either progressive or conservative uh, appointing a superintendent when I can get it down to three or four people. I think it definitely needs to be staying in the hands of the public. Thank you. Okay, the next card is Laurie McDade. Oh, that's good. And follow, that's a good idea, Mr. Bittner. Thank you. Following Laurie McDade will be Gary Yeldale. If you, once uh, Ms. McDade is speaking, if you'll come up and kind of be ready, we'll try to save some time. All right, Lord, Ms. McDade. Thank you very much. I'm Laurie McDade from Fleming Island, 2239 Harbor Lake Drive. I've spoken before at the board about this very issue. And with all due respect, Mr. Robinson, um, when you said that about the election process for the superintendent taking um or the appointment rather taking it out of the citizens hands the election process did that very thing for me last time when mr van zant and the uh, machinations of all the write-in and all that took it right out of my hands along with 54 58,000 others so to that point there's you know good and bad in both of these things and i'm not here to speak against any person it is certainly the process that I find flawed, and I share this with many, obviously 58,000 people. Um, and it is more about the appointment process more than the election process. And this whole thing seems to be muddied by a, like a porch fight about the type of environment that distracts from the original intent of this proposal. Um, with that said, please do not hear this as a personal attack against any person. I don't, I don't know. Mr. Van Zandt, I don't know the board members personally. Um, and it's just about this process of the elections and all the loopholes it opens up for manipulation. Um, uh, when I was talking to my son, who's fifth grader, about why I couldn't vote last time, he was confused because he's a very avid history buff. And he said, well, what about all those people that you know fought for this right for you to vote? I said, well, mom, you can't vote this time. And it was went back and forth with that and I have to agree with his disbelief that in this day and age and I'm sure all of us would agree that this is a vital and, and significant part of our due process and uh, for me to have to explain to him that whole process was very confusing for him um, but that is the main the systemic problem in the election process um, but obviously appointing a leader also opens up its own worries for some people who may fear this loss of their voice and I understand that obviously that feeling um, but in the grand scheme we have to think beyond the moment we have to think to the future of this 
and it could even garner closer attention to be paid to the school board election so that each person in the citizens citizenry would know their elected members better so they could better represent them when they appointed their superintendent who sorry but from my frame of reference as a mom of four students i've watched this county maintain a status not progressive not regressive really until this time where we dropped to a b which was unfortunate because as we saw in the budget that means loss, loss of tax revenue and that means people choosing an A district over B district as I would have when I moved here 14 years ago. Please approve this issue onto the ballot so the entire county, all the way from Keystone to Orange Park, can keep up with our growing demands. Thank you very much. Okay. The next speaker, Gary Yeldell, and on deck would be Sylvia Croft. Good evening, my name is Gary Yeldell, and I'm a resident of Clay County. I live on Alderman Road. Um, I do wanna make two brief points, and there are gonna be a lot of people talking tonight, and I'm sure they're gonna cover a lot of other points. There's no need for me to monopolize at the time. But first, uh, I've listened a lot to arguments, both on the for side of this and on the con side of this. Uh, there are good arguments on both sides, but at the end of the day, everyone who's been paying attention knows that this issue really isn't about the issue. This issue is about a vendetta against a person who did win an election. There were all kinds of things alleged about the election. I couldn't agree more with the previous speaker who said we need to look past this one point in time and look at the bigger picture. Because what at stake is our vote. Our vote, our right to vote, is, should be just as inalienable as our right to life liberty in pursuit of happiness. Without that right to vote, our other inalienable rights do become at risk. There's no two ways about that. And I know we're talking about a school board election, a superintendent election, and not a state or federal one, but the precedent is exactly the same. The right to vote, the value of that right to vote is no less important at the local level than it is at the state or the federal. One other point I would like to make is that a lot has been made about this effort of supposedly putting children over politics, putting politics aside, getting it out of our educational system, that is a farce. This effort, if successful, will do nothing to take politics out of education. This effort will simply consolidate political power in our educational system in the hands of fewer and fewer politicians. With all due respect, that is what you are on the board. You run for election, you get elected. You are a politician. And with all due respect, the politicians in whose hands it would be left have less education and less experience than the person we're supposedly trying to get rid of. I do not see the logic in that move, either in the short or the long term. I would encourage you, there are other solutions to this problem if there is one that do not involve giving up our right to select the superintendent and our right to vote. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Croft to be followed by, oh, he left, excuse me. Uh, Beth Correjas, Correjas, okay. Uh, Ms. Croft. I'm Sylvia Croft and I'm from Keystone Heights, Florida. Uh, I'm talking about the resolution concerning appointed versus elected superintendent. And the best counsel available to us, I believe, is in the Word of God. And I'm going to just read a short verse in Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That's exactly what started happening in our school district when a majority of our school board allowed a root of bitterness to take over. And now the whole district has been defiled by it, even to the point that we have been warned our accreditation is in jeopardy. This whole movement to appoint the superintendent rather than allow the people to elect one is all rooted in anger and bitterness. All any thinking person has to do is look back to the first time it was mentioned during the last election cycle 
When the chair was asked at a candidate's forum if she had her choice, would she rather have the superintendent elected or appointed? Her answer, it's according to who's elected. When Mr. Van Zant was elected, at the next meeting, Ms. Caracas almost had a nervous breakdown proclaiming there was a terrible emergency and they just had to get appointing the superintendent on the ballot right then. She was so beside herself, she did not even realize she was acting illegally. If this was not a personal agenda against Mr. Van Zant, this would have been as great a concern when Mr. Wortham was superintendent instead of it becoming an emergency when Mr. Van Zant won the election. Are you three willing to throw the whole school district to the dogs in order to satisfy a need for revenge? I don't think there's any way after you've so openly expressed and exposed your feelings in previous as well as tonight's school board meeting that any rational person is gonna believe you're doing this with any pure or neutral motive. Clay County citizens are not nearly as ignorant as you seem to think we are. You three are already in perfect agreement before you ever come to these meetings. You don't even have to discuss it and you all vote the same 99% of the time. I overheard one of the board member's sons telling another young man some time ago that standing up here and speaking against what you want to do just made the other young man look stupid. Didn't he understand that everything important had already been decided before he even got there? At the next meeting, I confronted him about that and he said to me, well, it's the truth. Why don't you get honest with yourselves and quit being dishonest with we the people about your true motivations? Thank you for letting me speak. Beth Corapayas? Cora Hyas, I'll get it. Okay, and you'll be followed by Elaine Weistock. Hi, I'm Beth Cora Hyas, and I live in Fleming Island. I grew up in a small town in Jay County, Indiana, where my niece still teaches in elementary school. I recently asked her about the job requirements for superintendents in Indiana. She replied, in quotes, superintendents need a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a superintendent's license. They must have taught for three years in a classroom, and they should have some years in administration as a principal or curriculum director. Many of the superintendents even have advanced degrees. The superintendent we have in Jay County has a doctorate degree in education. Our school district has been an A rated for four years and is up for a National Blue Ribbon Award as well as National Principal of the Year Award. For your information, the population of Jay County, Indiana is 21,000 and stable, sort of. The population of Clay County is 194,000 and maybe growing, I'm not sure. The job skills required for a superintendent of schools are extensive and demanding. They must wear many hats. They are the CEO of the school district and need to be effective communicator, a good manager, and a good listener. They need extensive knowledge of education, finances, and people skills. Instead of electing our superintendents with no requirements except they be 18 and live in Clay County, we need to adopt a professional approach in choosing our superintendent. By selecting them from a large nationwide pool of applicants who have advanced degrees and experience in the classroom and in administration. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Weistock, you're next, and then you'll be followed by Wendy Powell. Is Ms. Powell here? Oh, okay. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Elaine and I live in Fleming Island and I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. Clay County has a choice as to who heads its public schools. Will it choose an appointed official to head its public schools, someone who meets standards of competence and experience and has successfully implemented an academic program, overseen human resource and fiscal operations and executed a capital and operating plan, or will it choose an elected official, possibly someone with none of these qualifications? 
The Clay County Public School System has about 35,000 students, about 43 schools, between 4,800 and 5,000 employees, and a budget I hear now with capital uh, costs added to it of over $310 million. Only one other county, one other county in the state with a similar population has an elected superintendent of schools. All other counties in Florida have an appointed uh, superintendent of schools and in almost every other state in the union, the state requires that the superintendent of schools be appointed. Apparently, most folks have found that an appointed superintendent who meet, meets qualifying standards of professional competence and experience is best for education. For the past few years, Clay County has experienced difficulty financing educational services. It has defunded art and music in elementary schools, offers only one foreign language in high schools, and has fewer math and resource, science resource teachers as a result of budget cuts. During the last school board election, a panel of candidates was asked how they would handle the decreased funds available for public education, and few made a satisfactory response to that question. Recently, Clay County has witnessed conflict between its school board members and its superintendent of schools, a tug of war over the use of school funds and staffing. <clears throat> With an appointed superintendent, the lines of authority and responsibility would be clarified, sparing the citizens the drama of such an unfortunate and disruptive power struggle. And as Mr. Robinson noted, the BCC works with great amity among the participants because the, uh, the uh, uh, county manager is appointed, uh, whereas the members of the board uh, are elected. This is a critical time for Clay County Schools. We need the best management team that we can assemble. To ensure that educational excellence is maintained, I urge the school board to support the appointment of our superintendent of schools. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Powell, and you'll be followed by Richard Klein, Kleinsman? Kleinsman? Okay. Uh, before I begin, I was wondering if Mrs. Bush would just let me say something lighthearted um, before my three minutes begin, just to break the ice. Do what? Just to break the ice, I'll, before you start my three minutes, would you let me just say something lighthearted before I go into something very deep? It's up to the board chair. How long is the it's lighthearted? Very, it's for the business affairs. I thought they would thought it, think it was funny. Oh, yeah. okay. Cool. Um, I, now you've got me intrigued. Okay, okay let's do a lighthearted moment said, before you've got three Cope, minutes. Dr. Copeland and Mr. Merrill, in a nutshell, I gain much from your business affairs. Possibly you can make a bumper sticker that said, we shall build no sexy schools until it's time in honor of Orson Welles. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay, now your three minutes starts. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy Powell, 3512 Sheldon Road, Orange Park, Florida, 32073. I feel the board has closed its ears to my personal family's household, the common man. The people said no when not enough children over po politics petitions were not gained. Did the common man, such as the supermarket stock clerk, show zero interest in signing? Then uh, that person was saying no to having this placed on the ballot to a point. Did the waitress that did not sign the Children Over Politic Committee po form when approached, was that her no answer to your idea? Did the Save-A-Lot manager say no by not stopping at the town hall, hall Children's of Politics table? Then the answer was no. The possibility of the night security person of one of our local hotels considered a super voter when receiving the packet in his mailbox from Children Over Politics as I did for, forms. Uh, to sign, Did he, when he throw it away in the garbage, wasn't that him saying no? Haven't the people be heard already with a big no? Stirring this pot with retaliation are, are excuses, but not everyone in Clay works for the school system. Call me naive, but no means no the first time. No doesn't mean send this to the BCC and pretend to have a large caring heart for the children of Clay County. I said no when I was 22. I am 44 years old, and I will say no again. My household is considered a super vulgar household and should 
an appointed um, should appointed unnecessarily be placed on the November 4th ballot? The answer is still no. Because the people have spoken and said no. <laughs> they have passed by your tables and not filled out forms, but your ears are closed. It shouldn't take three or four no's to get your yes. In junior high, kids used to say, circle yes or no if you like me. We have circled, underlined, and priority mailed our no back to you, or at least mine. But you have closed your ears. Actions speak louder than words. When your workers for children over politics stood out in front of restaurants at the Clay County Fair and mailed forms, you didn't get your yes. You got your no. The answer to your junior high question of do you want an appointed superintendent is no. No still me no. No. Okay, Mr. Klinsman, and followed by Richard Bachman. Is, is Mr. Bachman in the room? Okay. Thank you. The, uh, the cuckoo clock is a nice touch. <laughs> uh, I was a member of the Charter Review Commission, and this issue came up not only for school superintendent, but for all of the constitutional office, officers. Every one of them showed up to give their input. Nobody from the public showed up. I don't think they care. They made this vote 20-something years ago. Yes, the, the population was much less than it is today, but statistically, the split will probably be the same. It certainly isn't going to be opposite. I think putting this issue on the ballot is a waste of time. And I, for one, appreciate my right to vote. Whether or not I like either candidate, it doesn't matter. It's the sanctity of the vote that is relevant. And the toxic miasma that is hanging over this district to the point of lowering our bond rating is not doing the children in these schools or the taxpayers in this county any good. Uh, by the way, it was nice to read and hear about the 11 schools increasing, but let's be totally transparent. We had eight schools that went down. This is the equivalent of educational whack-a-mole. I want all the schools to go up. I don't want one up, one down. That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and with the little time I have left, I want to address something else that came out. Uh, we need to set much higher standards of morality in this community. Just the other day, we had two savages masquerading as teenage girls, torturing a small animal for laughs. How did we miss this? in our community. How does this get by us? I would like us to focus a little bit more on everything that matters in our day-to-day -day lives and not a question that has been decided a long time ago. You know, th there was another attempt, what, a, f a few months ago to have a petition signed. Well, apparently it fizzled. Apparently there wasn't enough public interest in it and now this is a third attempt, which I strongly disagree with. And that's what I'd like to leave you with. I don't want to hear a cuckoo clock. Okay. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bachman and Richard Bachman, and you'll be followed by Gregory Collins. Is Mr. Collins here? Okay. Uh, my name is Richard Bachman, and I'm from uh, Fleming Island. Uh, the reason I'm up here and this is directed at uh, Mr. Van Zandt. Uh, he had suggested that he was very much against the citizens of Clay County to even be allowed to vote as to whether or not uh, they would in favor of an appointed uh, superintendent. And quite frankly, that is a conflict of interest. He has no business stating whether he wants to vote or whether he doesn't vote because he's not in that position. Uh, furthermore, uh, we, the job that he has done, I think, has, has been miserable, and I'll just give you some examples. 
my granddaughter just graduated from high school at Fleming Island. The least I would have expected is Mr. Van Zandt to be there to be a speaker, and he was not there. On the other hand, I have a grandson that I flew out to Dallas, Texas that also graduated, and of course the superintendent of schools were there, plus many other officials. I read in the paper where the Times Union has asked Mr. Van Zandt for his various statements. He doesn't, he doesn't communicate with him. He doesn't email him. And as far as I'm concerned, he's doing a very poor job. And what this county needs, it needs an appointed superintendent that's under the control of the Board of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Collins, and you'll be followed by Mike Trudell. Mr. Trudell, are you in the audience? Okay. Hello. I'm uh, Gregory Collins. My address is 1668. Oh, starting. Okay. Uh, I'm a product of the Clay County School System. I went to Fleming Allen Elementary. I went to Fleming Allen High School. And now I'm a uh, engineering student at the University of Miami. That's my first time at a board meeting, and I, I just want to say I'm very overwhelmed and uh, impressed by the pomp and circumstances and how well organized it is. I'm not, however, impressed by how our uh, county superintendent is obtained. Now, 47 out of 50 states have no counties with elected superintendents. Even in this state, we have half and half. Um, now, those other states, that's Alabama and Mississippi. Now, neither of those are actually models of excellence in education. One of them's ranked 50 out of 50. One of them's 45th. Now, correlation is not causation. Evidence is not a verdict. But let's discuss the evidence. Now, here, let's talk about our neighbors in St. John's County. They're actually very similar to us in population as well as population that has a well-off, a high-income population. Very similar in most aspects. One aspect that they're not similar in is they have an appointed superintendent, an appointed superintendent with a PhD in education, and really has pulled the whole county's uh, education way up. Now, Clay County once was the place to come uh, for up and coming families that really cared about their kids' education. Now, St. John's has passed us by. Now, um, I'd like to say, Mr. Van Zandt actually just exclaimed recently our two, 2014 FCAT scores as fantastic. And I actually pulled them up on my dad's uh, cell phone over there. Uh, and I also pulled up St. John's ones as well. Now, some scores are pending, fine. Uh, there's uh, four high schools in Clay County that are not in this statistic. Now, St. John's has 23 A schools, five B schools, and a singular lonely C school. We have 18 A schools, four B schools, eight C schools, oh, and, and a D school as well. Um, shouldn't, with how many dedicated, fantastic teachers that we have in Clay County, couldn't we so do so much better than that? Now, as a good uh, student, I actually checked out the GPAs. Um, I, I checked out the GPAs of the two places, and St. John's has a 3.74 GPA, summa cum laude, congratulations. We're down at a 3.23, you know, just chugging along. I would rather see a 3.7 GPA, summa cum oh, okay, whatever. Uh, so I would rather see a 3.7, a summa cum laude, than an average getting by student. And that's what we are right now in Clay County. Correlation isn't causation, evidence isn't a verdict, but to me, the writing is on the wall. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker, Mike Trudell, sponsored, uh, followed by uh, Wayne Geiger. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board, Superintendent. Mike Trudell, Orange Park. Mr. Joe Riley has filed a formal complaint now in the state attorney's office based on information he uncovered from public records. Fact one, his complaint lists possible allegations of misconduct, violations of the Sunshine Law, and inappropriate meetings using words such as collusion, unethical communications, and corruption against three board members, as well as the board attorney. Per the complaint, evidence shows Mrs. Carricas helped form a political action committee, Children Over Politics, activity which gives the appearance of impropriety. 
He alleges public records and a specific email between the attorney and his wife show that the attorney also was helping to organize the PAC. Further, Mr. Trudell, let me ask you something. What does this have to do with let the, me finish, uh, please. Uh, the resolution to place the question of appointment versus election? Let me finish, please. Uh, this is uh, bordering on slander. No, it's not. Uh, afraid of the truth. You're afraid of the truth, woman. Uh, sir, I think that uh, this has you been need filed to with the state's you, attorney's office. Well, you you know have what? not responded to it. I'll it must be standing. Sir, you need to be addressing this item. If you want to talk like this, you wait to the end of the meeting under okay. presentations I, from the audience. Okay, fine. But this is about fine. this agenda item. I heard you. Don't scream I'll at continue. me, sir. Uh, if you scream at me again, I will have to ask you to be seated. May I continue? If you can talk about the subject of this uh, card, the green card is okay. To let's talk this about the petition. Okay. Fact: By the deadline, the petition got 917 signatures. 9,700 were required. Compared to 134,445 clay voters, that equates mathematically to 0.68%, less than 1% of the electorate. My opinion, voters were asked, they replied, no. Fact, Mrs. Bullock in a Channel 4, and I am owed extra time, by the way. Mrs. Bullock in a Channel 4 video dated March 11th was, quote, Okay, with the superintendent remaining in an elected position, but would like to see required qualifications. Thank you. Quoting again, she continued, his personal experience, speaking of Mr. Van Zant, having been on the school board for about, I think, 12 years. Let me repeat that. His personal experience, having been on the school board for about, I think, 12 years, so he did get that background, correct? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Yoda, um, Just a Trudell, uh, if you would finish your sentence and then your time's up. Uh, I timed this this afternoon about 40 times. I'm under three minutes, you interrupted me. I'll finish if you don't mind. Uh, I would like for you to finish your speech. We've got 30 seconds. All right, I can get it done. Throughout the video, Mrs. Bullock made what an impartial viewer would easily conclude were favorable comments about the superintendent's performance. She was the voice of reason. Tonight, Mrs. Bullock, please, refrain, please realize that getting this on the ballot has been an obsession for Mrs. Caracas since August 2012. I ask you, dig deep, be the voice of reason you were, distance yourself from this. Don't permanently sully your reputation by participating in ramming through this resolution which curtails the, the right to vote for 134,000 citizens. Make a stand and do the right thing. I apologize for raising my voice. I appreciate you letting me continue. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Wayne Geiger, to be followed by Stanley Finning. Good evening, Madam Chairman, uh, Superintendent Van Zandt, and the school board. Thank you for giving me a moment to speak. <clears throat> We're all aware that Florida statutes allow superintendents to either be elected or appointed. However, the, sta the statutes are very specific on the legal components to activate this process. There's been references to any endo that some members of the board and their attorney have met out of the sunshine to consider these matters. I don't know for that first fact, and I certainly hope it's not true. Our original framer set a standard of checks and balances in order to ensure the public be served unbiased by their elected officials. Folks, we are blessed to be in America and live in a de democratic society. And since 1776, many young people in our country have given their lives for us to have the right to vote. Presently, we have a very large 
number of registered voters in our county. Our officials should be put into office by the power of the people and not a select committee and these five members of a school board. Please don't take our voting rights away. Those are our inalienable rights. Folks, a, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Let's let the trivial matters aside and get down to the business of benefiting our children. Thank you for your time. Okay, Mr. Stanley Fenning to be followed by Virginia Collins. Stanley Fanning, I live in Clay Hill, Florida, the United States of America. And I'm also a former Charter Review Commissioner. And your board attorney came down there and told us that the Charter has no authority over the school board or the superintendent. It was very clear. The county attorney agreed. The Charter Review Commissioner, that Janice Carrick's son, Michael, handpicked, he agreed. It's very clear that what was attempted with the, the petition drive was flawed from the beginning. The petitions to amend the charter must be single subject. The one that was about a, a nonpartisan or uh, and, and to provide a means for recall, those are more than one subject going to on a petition, they were going to be challenged. And it was well known that they were going to be challenged in a court of law and they weren't going to make the ballot. The, the petition drive failed miserably. Look at the amount of money they raised. $4,500 the first month, $1,500 the second month, $125 the third month, zero the fourth month. They, uh, they didn't get it done. The, the attempt to render null and void the voice of the voters of Clay County is, is a shame. And Tina Bullock, I'm going to speak to you through the chair directly because you're the swing vote. You represent my district. I've asked you to think about your political career privately, and I'm going to ask you publicly to think about the opportunity to be the first two-year school board member in the history of Clay County. Is that how you want your legacy to stand, or would you prefer to have the opportunity to do what you think is best for Clay County? Because the people are watching. We, the people, are watching. This, this election, we have a qualified opponent, District 3. Mrs. Bullock, please consider your swing vote status. You told me, oh, I don't want that uh, swing vote status. 27 seconds left. Mrs. Bullock, you didn't want it. I asked you then and I ask you now, embrace the swing vote. Do the right thing. Do what the people sent you here to do and represent District 3 not your two partners at Longhorn. Thank you. Okay, uh, Virginia Collins to be followed by Sarah Spurrier. Hello, I'm Virginia Collins, uh, 1668 Misty Lake Drive, Fleming Island. Um, I believe the voters of Clay County should be given the right to vote on an issue that affects the greatest resource, our children. So I encourage you to put children over politics and put appointing the superintendent with qualifications versus electing on the November ballot. While the school board is responsible for setting the overall policy of the district, it is the superintendent is tasked with running the school district on a day-to-day -day basis. The superintendent of schools is the chief administrator of the district. Unfortunately, our school district has slipped from an A designation to a B designation this year. Studies reveal a high correlation between the success of a school system and the leadership of the superintendent. Effective leadership can be a critical to any school system in maintaining or improving 
performance indicators such as dropout rates, graduation rates, standardized testing, student attendance, and college entrance tests. This is all according to the research done by Dr. Uh, Bainbridge. The superintendent's position is very similar to our Clay County manager, who is an appointed by the Clay County Board of County Commissioners. The Clay County manager is responsible for running uh, the county government day to day, while the Clay County Commissioners set the guiding policy. This is not a new idea to have an appointed superintendent. On a national scale, of the more than 15,000 school districts in the United States, less than 150 of them elect the superintendent. That is less than 1%. Only three states allow the election of superintendents. They are Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida not known for their high educational standards. Our neighbors in St. John's um, changed to an appointed superintendent in 1992 and have been the number one school district in Florida since 1997. A great advantage to having an appointed superintendent is that we can choose from a broad pool of qualified candidates and remove uh, residency restrictions allowing the selection to be based solely on professional qualifications and leadership, leadership skills rather than vote-getting ability of only those individuals living in the county who are willing to run for the office. The superintendent's position has changed over the decades and we need to let Clay County Schools be the best they can be. Thank you. I'm sorry, our, when it does that, they don't know why it's doing that, but it's a warning. And then you have, she said, when it, when it makes those noise and all the lights start going off like you've won the lottery or something, you've got 30 more seconds, they think. I thought I was just magnetic. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. And you'll be followed by Leanne Kolb. Okay. My name is Sarah Spurrier. I live uh, in Green Cove Springs. I have lived in Clay County for 41 years. I have three children that have graduated from the Clay County Schools. I have three grandchildren that are in the Clay County Schools now. I have always supported and been very proud of our school system. Unfortunately, I am very insulted when I was at the Clay County Fair, I saw the booth, Children Over Politics, and I thought, well, that's, that's good. But unfortunately, Ms. Studdard was sitting there and she asked me to sign these two petitions. Mm -hmm. Well, these two petitions were directly political. They were not Children Over Politics. And under that guise, I'm being told that I don't need to have a vote. I should not be able to vote that children of our politics tells me that I'm not smart enough to vote, that the children of our politics tells me that the school board has the only intelligence and they're the only ones that have the power to appoint a superintendent. Very political, nothing to do with children of our politics. Now, Ms. Studdard and Ms. Caracas, when was the last time you placed something on the agenda that was actually about our children. It really seems that something has gone terribly wrong in my Clay County. Our ch children over politics has rapidly become politics over children. That is never acceptable for our children to suffer because of politics. I'm a grandparent. You don't want to rile grandparents when it comes to their grandkids. You don't want to mess with grandparents' children because we get very upset about that. And I'm sure there's plenty of grandparents here that understand this. Ms. Bullock, you have the power. You have the power to stop this right now. We have got to stop this. You have the power to do what the school board should be doing, and that's put our children first. I can assure you that I will work very hard 
to keep the power of the vote in the hands of we the people. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Leanne Kolb, and you'll be followed by Travis Christensen. Is Mr. Christensen here? Okay. Hello, my name is Leanne Kolb, and um, my husband and I own AFR Christian Karate in Clay County. I live in Middleburg, Florida. We've lived here for almost 15, I'm sorry, 15 years. I am against having five people appoint our superintendent. I know most of you guys personally, and I have heard you at one time or other say that you are for um, small government. You're against big government. You're against government ruling our lives. I've heard that out of your mouths, but your actions seem to be saying something different. For instance, the 2012 emergency vote for um, this item to be placed on the ballot. Um, when you started a pack with children over politics so that um, you could continue to pursue this in secret, keeping the public effectively out of the loop with uh, meetings in private that not all the school board members were invited to or even at, which is uh, illegal. Um, trying to get enough petitions signed to get it on the ballot, and once that also failed, here we have your Hail Mary. Um, I think that the people of Clay County have absolutely made their opinions known. I feel like if we had put as much time and effort into our children and their education as we've put into this issue, we would not have so many schools that are C schools. They would be better off. If you guys would put more emphasis on actually putting things on um, the floor that affect our, our future children's education and their benefits, we would be doing a lot better with our FCAT testing and results. Mrs. Bullock, I know that you seem to be the target of everybody because you are that swing seat. Um, I know there are, but I feel like two of them are fairly set in, in what they feel like they're going to vote, and the other two are also. And, and so I am going to I am going to raise this to you. Um, you did state in March on News for Jax. I watched the interview again today um, that you were okay with the superintendent being elected. You would like to see more requirements, but you said that you believe that Mr. Van Zant has been a benefit to Clay County. And then you also went on to say that he had brought some really good things to the table whenever he became superintendent. But yesterday in the Florida Times Union, it stated that now you all of a sudden are supporting an appointed superintendent instead. And I'm wondering what changed in the span of four months. Um, I don't know if maybe you were at part of those meetings with them and, and you know, I don't know. I am calling on you to be the voice of reason though. Obviously the people in Clay County, um, they still do want limited government. I know I do. Thank you. Okay, okay Mr. Christensen, and be followed by Keith Nichols. Travis Nichols. Christensen. It's just a minute. Is Mr. Nichols still here? Oh, there you are. Oh, no, okay. 28701 of Firm Court. I have some uh, copy remarks so I can approach the bench. Uh, if you will give it to the deputy, he'll bring it up. No, I'm speaking tonight as representative of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Clay County. We at the RLC asked this board to vote no in placing this item on the ballot. In case it is passed, we resolve to defeat it in the ballot box. Now, a few things I asked the board. If you insist upon putting this item on the ballot, you need to, you need to uh, revise this ballot language. Proposed language is deceptive, does not disclose that a yes vote is in favor of giving up the right to vote for the superintendent's office. Failure to disclose this information leaves this board vulnerable to legal action. And failure to disclose information was one of the justifications for the 2008 lawsuit of Lyons versus Citizens for Term Limits and Accountability, which went all the way to the Florida Supreme Court. Nobody wants the schools to get sued. I think if you put in this form, somebody's going to sue you. Furthermore, I believe you should disclose that the right to vote for citizens once it's taken away, it's a lot harder to get it back because it's contingent upon a future board deciding whether to put on the ballot, which is unlikely because having an appointed superintendent does empower the board. There I have some on the, the remarks I gave you, I have some proposed language at the very least. You need to be very clear with the voters. If they vote yes on this item, you know, don't put, I don't want you to put it on there, but if you do, be very clear. If they vote yes on this item, they are giving away the right to vote in future elections for a superintendent. The second point, 
Clay County would lose representation and gain nothing from having a sup an appointed superintendent. Heard quite a bit about what happens in other states, but we don't live in other states. Clay County is in Florida. No matter what's in the ballot, we'll still be under the Florida education system. Now, heard a lot of people talk about how much better would be to have an appointed superintendent. Well, I looked at a lot of statistics as far as, you know, district ratings, and I used math. And if I averaged them out and compared them, appointed schools versus, you know, appointed superintendents versus elected across the state of Florida, it comes out almost dead even. Now, as far as county size, I looked at the 20,000 to 60,000 range, which is about clay, probably clay for the next 10 or 15 years, again, almost a dead heat. Now, how can this be? If someone has all these qualifications, why wouldn't their schools be better on average? It's because an appointed superintendent is an employee with five bosses who has to do three, keep three happy to keep their job. Therefore, is no better than the board that, that directs them. And finally, okay. all right. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Christensen. Uh, we'll revise that language. You're going to get <coughs> we have the paper. We'll read it. Uh, Keith Nichols and be followed by, is this Michael Wingate? Okay. I'm Keith Nichols. I live in Green Cove. And I don't know why, but every time I get up here and I look at these uh, chairs, I always think about the Pink Floyd song, uh, The Final Cut, or off their 83 album, The Final Cut, the Fletcher Memorial Home. I, I don't know why that is, so maybe somebody can listen to it and tell me. Uh, one of the things that I've heard a lot is people sitting there saying, you know, let's do what's right by the children. And I've heard that from Mr. Finning and, Mo and Ms. Cross both. Well, the thing is, and I don't know where he gets his data, because every data I've shown has shown that everywhere there's appointed superintendents, there's a rise in the public education. And so what I want to understand is, you know, if you want to do what's right by the children, then voting to pass this amendment and put it on the ballot is the right thing to do. First off, it gives people a chance to, you know, express their views. Second off, you know, we need to look at this at the simple fact that this is not a government entity. We keep thinking of our schools as being a government entity and it's not. What it is is a public service institution that is run by a government entity. Okay, we need to start focusing on our kids and you all keep saying that. Now in 1992, the Tennessee legislature voted to make all superintendent schools appointed positions. Since 1992, the Tennessee legislature has amended the law to allow local governments to move back to an elected school superintendent position if they so desire. Not one single district has done that. Now, one of the things you, you all keep listening to, you know, close to 8,000 or, excuse me, 1,500 school districts throughout the United States, and only 149 of them have elected positions. If an appointed superintendent doesn't make much sense, then why are we in such a minority? Now. I've actually talked to Dr. Luke Cornelius, and if you all want to really study this matter, you need to get him in here and you need to listen to him. It is an ideal whose time has come. It's an ideal that will help our kids. And I have nothing against Mr. Van Zandt. I have absolutely nothing against Mr. Van Zandt. Okay, but this is something that we need to look at to be able to better our school systems, because one of the things that you all do not realize is that the better we make our school systems, the better we're going to make our communities, because we'll be able to draw in better businesses, We'll be able to raise our living standards. It, it just goes around that we'll be able to raise our taxes. We'll have more money for schools. It is the right thing to do. Now, everybody keeps sitting here and attacking Ms. Uh, Bullock and telling her, you know, that you're the swing vote. Well, yes, you are, Ms. Bullock. But when these people are sitting there and they're telling you don't take away their right to vote, what I want to tell you to do and what I want to ask for you and plead is for you to think about the children. I want you to think about how this will impact them. Don't worry about whether you get reelected or not. Worry about the future of the children. Okay? Thank you. All right, Michael Wingate to be followed by James Trot. Is Mr. Trot here? Good evening, Michael Wingate, 633 Thornwood Lane. As it stated before by several speakers, this is certainly an issue when you look at appointed versus elected, it has pros and cons on both sides. And if you've spent some time, which I'm sure the board has, as you spend some time, one can make a good argument for both cases. So in something this close, I tend to look at, and I'm sure you do too, what is the tipping point when you get to a decision that is this close? And I've just got a couple of thoughts I just wanted to share with you about that. However, I want to state at the beginning 
that I do believe, and after 31 years' experience in our Clay County school system, I do believe this is a bad decision for our school district. But let me give you a few examples of reasons why I feel like this is going to be a problem for us. Here we are right now. We're, getting, we're starting to make headway. We have, we have some initiatives going on in our school district right now. For example, the high school redesign with the academies, which, by the way, you strongly support. We've got all these initiatives going on K through 12, and this is going to be nothing but over the next several months a distraction for the workers out there. I can tell you that if the teachers or the administrators or district folks, if they're not going to openly say anything about this and they, they really feel strong about this, here's the one thing they will say. This is going to be a distraction for us over the next several months. You can only imagine around the water cooler, in the hallways, etc. This is going to be a topic of conversation for us. This is going to take time and energy away from where we're headed. As this initiative, the high school redesign, is gaining traction throughout the country and certainly in our county, this is going to slow us down and be a distraction. So my point on this is, why now? This is not a good time to do this at this point. What you're going to have happen is you're going to have people bantering back and forth about what is the public going to do on this in November? What's going to happen if it does pass, which I do not believe it will? What's going to happen with a new person coming in? Do we change philosophies? Do we shift initiatives? Where are we going to be at in a couple years down the road? This is doing nothing but going to cause a distraction. I can tell you after 31 years, the strength of Clay County has always been our stability. It has been our leadership. It has been the continuity that we've had in philosophies. It has been our stability over all this time. That's what we need to maintain right here. Now, I'm in no way suggesting that we can't or we, we don't need to have good ideas and fresh ideas and energy coming into our system. Nobody believes that, but now is not the time. I can tell you what, we've got a good track record in Clay County of electing folks that do a good job, and here's the mechanism that will correct if there's something wrong, and that's called the voting booth. If the citizens aren't happy with where we're headed, they'll make the corrections, and we should be trusting them to make those corrections and everything. That's what will happen. It may not happen as fast as we all want it to, but it will correct itself, I promise you. We need to trust where we're headed, and we need to trust the citizens of Clay County on this matter, okay? Thank you, sir. All right, the next speaker is James Trott to be followed by Nancy Ulrich. <laughs> My name is James Trott, live at 4276 Yvonne Terrace in Middleburg. Thank you for hearing me tonight. A little bit about me, 68 to 73 I was in the Marine Corps, 73 to 93 I was in the Army. I retired as a first sergeant with NATO secret security clearance. I graduated from Jones College with a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in uh, legal assisting. I'm an educated idiot, I know that. Duval appoints their superintendent. Cost them $2 million to get rid of the last one. We don't need that. He had a PhD. Thank you, but I don't think so. Also, I don't really care about anybody else from any other state. And I don't really want somebody from another state to come in here and be my superintendent. I want somebody from Clay County to be my Clay County superintendent. I could go into all the statistics, but I don't want to do that. You've already been beat to death with them anyway. People who sit out here, uh, worry about the children, don't worry about these people, what they say. You better worry about me. I vote. The kids don't. Okay? <laughs> There's a lot of other people that vote, too. It's coming, people. It's coming. Okay, there's been a lot of other stuff said, okay? Uh, I've also contacted Governor Scott's office and requested an investigation. Uh, he responded that uh, they'll get back to me on that. <laughs> so, you know, will I ever hear from him again? Probably not. Okay, I got some questions for you. They may, may be rhetorical questions. And uh, I probably won't take my entire three minutes. Was anything ever happened on the uh, trying to illegally place that item on the agenda? Was she ever disciplined? Has she ever apologized? 
Would our attorney give valuable legal advice to some of the board members at the exclusion of others? I should hope not. Uh, and, you know, all the accusations that have been going on and stuff, they're out there. You know they are, and you know you're going to have to deal with them. That goes along with this. Now, you know, whether it was shady the way he got elected or whether it was not shady, it was legal. It was all above board. And I believe it will be the same way in the next election. If the people want him, they'll vote for him. If they don't want him, they won't vote for him. That's the same thing for everybody in those chairs up there. If they don't want you, they won't vote for you. Let the people's voice be heard. Say no on this. Thank you. Okay, and the last green card, Nancy Ulrich. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, Superintendent, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. <clears throat> My name is Nancy Ulrich. I live at 61 Fox Valley Road in Orange Park. And as a 36-year Clay County resident, I've owned a research firm here for more than 33 years. I take a little bit different approach than what we've heard so far. I'm not going to talk about the kids. I'm going to talk about the voters. My daughter attended SBJ, Ridgeview Junior, and graduated from Orange Park High. Uh, the teacher's in the room, her name was Chase, and yes, she's still alive and doing well. It probably strikes fear in your heart to know she's still around. Uh, my son attended Ridgeview Elementary and Junior High and graduated from St. John's Country Day School. As a researcher, I have conducted hundreds of political polls, many of them in Clay County, and I've carefully studied the electorate. Who votes, how they vote, why they vote, and when they vote. I feel like I'm in a room of super voters right now, and everybody needs to realize that I can go and check public records and know if you are registered and how many times you voted in the last elections. Not how you voted, but if you voted. Um, I must stress that my forthcoming statements are not a reflection of this seated board or the superintendent, but based on my experience with at least five elected superintendents over more than three decades, and each one of you on this dais right now have been in at least one of my polls, either as a candidate, as a client, or as an opponent. These three facts, my longevity in the county, my experience with a variety of schools and educators more than 16 years when my children were in school, and being a professional pollster, placed me in a somewhat unique position to make a strong plea for placing this initiative on the ballot to make our superintendent an appointed position as opposed to an elected position. Why do I feel so strongly about this? The reasons are very, very simple. And I'm going to tell it like it is. Remember, this is not directed at any one individual. Elections tend to be a popularity contest. Congratulations, y'all very popular when you got elected. There are, a few there are a very few qualifying criteria, and the most qualified person does not necessarily win. And this applies to any election, not just for school board or for superintendent. Voter apathy is appalling. For being such a sacred right and privilege, as we've heard here tonight by all the people that espouse protect the vote, it is an astounding number of people who do not even take the time to vote. Of those who do vote, the vast majority uh, can be described as follows. They vote the party line, they have never met the candidate, they don't know much about the candidate or their qualifications for the job. Rarely do they attend public debates to hear the issues or gatherings to meet the candidates. Elections can divide the will of the people, especially in a small community such as Clay County. Elected officials become politicians. They don't always start out that way. We have statesmen. Instead of doing the job they were elected to do, they posture themselves to be reelected over and over again if there are no term limits. Is, is there, are you about to finish? Almost that? finished. I'll talk okay. really fast. Okay. There are many disenfranchised citizens in an election. Not everyone gets to vote. I've seen candidates elected in the primary by a single party. Campaign supporters have vested interests. Collectively, each campaign costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Where do the monies come from and what is the obligation? The ever-changing dynamics of our school system and the inertia created by the federal and state governments, can you say Common Core? Demand the proven track record of a skilled and experienced executive to stay abreast of the bureaucratic beast. You have heard from many people tonight speaking on behalf of maintaining the position as an elected uh, position. Some in favor of the appointed, I urge you to take heart in what I have shared with you this evening. I feel passionately about this and stand committed to follow through this. 
If not this year, then next. And for these reasons, I strongly and firmly assert the appointed superintendent. Thank you. What is that noise? What is that Thank noise? Thank you very much. I will. They're calling for time, and I. Uh, sir. I still have. If he keeps talking out, would you no, remove I will, him? I will conclude. Mm -hmm. I will Thank conclude. You. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ulrich. Um, okay, then I will bring this to the board. That's the completion of all of our green cards. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? What is this? Who? Oh, okay. If you'll pass those. Uh, I had a motion uh, by Ms. Carica, second by Ms. Bullock. Any discussion? I I'd like to say a few things. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. I had taken a few notes, and um, I certainly do appreciate everybody having the opportunity to uh, speak to us tonight. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, you know, have taken note of is throughout the years of if we have a superintendent that is appointed and the board is the one that uh, selects them, then you know certainly we should have higher standards for school board members also. In other words, you know the requirements of a superintendent, you know, would be um, a master's degree, doctorate degree, or whatever you'd want. But if the people that are selecting him don't have those qualifications or in that neighborhood then that should be a concern of the citizens in Clay County. So that's just food for thought. Um, but I had written myself a little couple of notes down here, and um, during the next several months, much will be written and spoken about the issue of elected versus appointed superintendent that will appear on the ballot. In considering your evaluation of this issue, I urge you to take in consideration the following criteria. Accountability. We all look for accountability in our government representatives. What is more accountable than an elected official? Whether appointed or elected, superintendents of public education are empowered by Florida law to make significant decisions affecting the education of our children. Like other policymakers, they ought to be accountable to the people in a representative political system. If we accept the premise that the position should be appointed, the superintendent then becomes accountable not to the voters, but to at least three school board members. The other criteria is independence. The current system has a check and balance between the elected superintendent and the elected members of the board. The school board can and does question without reservation recommendations made by the superintendent. On the other hand, the superintendent is free to engage in recommendations which, though controversial, are based on professional education of the professional education in Clay County. Appointed superintendents are constantly seeking approval and assuring that their activities are representative not of the majority of students or citizens of the county, but of at least three members of the school board. In a democracy, members of our governmental bodies ought to be directly accountable and elected by people who are permitted to run issue-oriented campaigns. Representative government is best when it is closest to the people. I urge you to continue to allow the superintendent of public edu education to be elected. Okay, anyone else? But yeah, Ms. McKinnon? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I think it's, I think my position um, on the subject is, is very well known, um, which I did state openly during my campaign two years ago that um, I, in my position, I believe that the superintendent should also remain an elected position. Um, but one of the things that I want to talk about today 
um, is really, I, I want to state my opposition in three points that I'd like to make. And I put a slide together that I'd like to share with everybody. And uh, if it's okay, I'm going to go on over to the podium and bring it up. Is that okay? Certainly. If you need any help, Dr. Copeland's really good with that. <laughs> I think I can manage. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things, um, you know, my first point that I really want to talk about is the manner in which this whole thing has been brought before us. And um, that's really the first thing that's my, been my biggest concern about this is, is this really about the children? Um, and so what I had to do is I had to go back two years and I had to look and try to put, pull all the pieces together of things that have taken place over the past two years. And so for the benefit of the timeline, I wanted to put a timeline together just to kind of show you. I know you guys can't see all this, but I'm going to kind of walk you through it. So really. What happens is, I went back, this whole thing started back in 2012, back here. And you guys have heard a lot about this tonight from a bunch of different speakers. Back in 2012, there was an item, an emergency, there was an attempt to put an emergency item on the agenda to make this um, position an appointed one and, and to, put it on the, to put it on the ballot. Um, that ended up making the headlines the very next day that it was an illegal action and it didn't happen. Um, and then as I was going through some of the things, some of the emails that had recently been released, I came over an email and this was like in 2013. And I'd just like to point it out to you. I'm not sure if you guys can all see this, but what this is, this was an email from a local citizen to Ms. Studdard. And this person was asking for help about how to impeach the superintendent. What's really interesting about this email is not so much that there was a citizen asking for help from Mrs. Studdard on how to impeach the superintendent, but that this email was forwarded from Mrs. Studdard to Mr. Michael Karakis, Ms. Janice Karakis, and Ms. Tina Bullock. So? Then we move on and we get a political action committee formed called Children Over Politics. And the interesting, about, interesting thing about the Children Over Politics is I went and looked at their website, and I was never really involved in it. I never really paid much attention to it. And you know, a lot of people said tonight there are positive arguments on both sides, and I, I'm not going to debate that issue. I think that there are positive arguments on both sides. But the P political action committee children over politics was formed for one reason and one reason only and that was for the reason of putting this measure on the ballot they exist for no other reason and so i thought that was kind of odd then we get to march of 2014 and we have the cop petition drive starts which we all know how that turned out um, during that petition drive um, all of a sudden, we start getting Facebook photos and news media and all kinds of stuff. Pictures of Miss Studdard um, at the petition drive at Orange Park. Now, whether she was there getting petitions or not, I'm not sure. But in that photograph there, you can see her having a cozy little conversation with Miss Collins. And then tonight, I just learned from one of the other citizens um, that Miss Studdard was sitting at that booth during the uh, fair. I worked almost every day at the fair, Ms. McKinnon. Okay. I okay. certainly did. Sure. Um, and then also I wanted to highlight the fact that um, also on that day I, I also saw the, um, the news um, uh, of Mrs. Bullock basically stating her position. And so I just also want to say thank you for saying that. I think it was a fair, fair position. Then uh, we get down here. Excuse me, I have the floor. I'm a school Sir, board member. Uh, Ms. McKinnon, Excuse let me, me handle this. Ms. McKinnon, so you're out of order. Either sit down. If you do get up again or speak out, you will be removed. All right, and, Ms. McKinnon, continue. Thank you. 
And then um, one of the other things that has recently come to revelation was an email that was also mentioned by somebody else here tonight, an email that I found interesting. And this was an email that was basically from Mrs. Collins to, I believe, um, Mr. Bickner's wife. I'm not sure because I'm not certain of the address, uh, the email address. But she was basically thinking that she was emailing Bruce saying, hey, it was really nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing your time, talent, and treasure. Uh, and Ms. I look McKenna, forward to working with you. Let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. What is, is the, are you saying that it's illegal for no. Ms. No, Collins no, 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 to no, send no. Mr. Bickner or no. Mrs. Bickner, no, whoever not. that is, an email? No, I mean, I'm what not. has that got to do with this? You'll let me finish. I'll make my, finish my okay. point. Let's, okay, let's get to it. Okay, I'm getting to it. Then the other, th the, the other thing that's interesting about this email is that um, Mr. Bickner basically in this email admits that he was at this meeting at the Caracas home. This was a meeting that was at the Caracas home between Miss Collins was there speaking, it was at the Caracas home, and Mr. Bickner was there. Now I'm not saying there's anything illegal about that. All I'm saying is that you're it shows. You're certainly implying that there's no, something I'm not. illegal, and I can host anybody I'd like. You absolutely can. Absolutely. What I'm doing is I'm just trying to show all the things that have been happening over the past two years. Are you going to have a picture of Longhorns? Because Tina and Janice and I went to the Tippecop day for the uh, then, last raising year, the you money. Stop interrupting me. your fellow board members. Mr. Van Zandt, you don't have the floor. Way. All right, go ahead, Ms. Then, McKenna. during the May 24 board meeting, um, Mr. Keith Nichols came up and spoke and actually went back, and he said something that night that actually kind of turned the light bulb on for me. And I want to quote what he said because I went and pulled it back up on the video. Keith Nichols was speaking that night, and he was talking about, well, he was actually up here talking about um, the pay um, that school bus drivers get. But then he went on to say, and I'm going to quote, it says, I had a chance to talk to Ms. Studdard about the Children Over Politics campaign. I mentioned how there was no need for a petition campaign because by state law, all it would take was a majority vote by the board to have amendment put on the ballot. And your response, and he was referring to you, Ms. Studdard, your response was, quote, there are two board members facing re-election challenges and you did not see them wanting to bring up the issue since there wasn't a consensus among the citizens. My question is, how do you know that? How did you know that they didn't want that up? Okay, so. I then, didn't, you misquoted that, but that's okay, go ahead. I, I'm just quoting what. Go, go ahead. quoting what he said. Go ahead. Okay, then. Lo and behold, we get a formal complaint filed and this revelation of emails, text messages, all kinds of things happening before, between board members. Um, and it goes on and on and on. Then the petition drive fails for lack of signatures. And then after that, we get the COP attempting to blame that on um, intimidation tactics. Yeah, thank you, intimidation tactics. So here we are today. Okay, and the only reason why I, I, I say all this is because I'm, I'm really like, what, what have we been doing for the past two years? And, um, you know, as I think about it, I, I'm thinking in addition to all of this stuff that's been going on for the past two years, um, there's been some other things that I just want to mention here that have been going on for the past two years. In addition to all of this, we have board members who have overstepped their statutory authority time and time again trying to do through policy what the Florida statutes won't allow you to do. In human resources policy through job descriptions, in business affairs policy by micromanaging schools and creating red tape. And let me just remind everybody, we had numerous principals come here and speak out about that and they pleaded not to pass those policies but their pleas went unheard. And now, here we are today, we've got evidence has come to light suggesting that secret meetings are taking place between Mr. Bickner, his legal assistant, Ms. Collins, at board members' houses. Mr. Bickner sending different versions of legal memos to different school board members. Um, evidence via public records of email communications between members of the board. Text messages about meeting together. And now, even tonight, members of the public are not allowed to speak on this very issue and their free speech is not being allowed. And so I just want to say that 
the main point of my, one of the big main points of my opposition to this is really the manner in which all this is brought. And the question is, is this really about the kids? I don't think it is. I think everything that we've heard tonight and everything that all of this suggests is that this really is just about a personal vendetta. And um, I, I just, and to Mr. Wingate's point, I just, I mean, I hadn't even thought about the timing of all of this. It's just, I don't think it's the right time either. And so I just, I wanted to point this out. This is really why I don't, um, I don't like the idea of doing this. And last thing, I think the people have spoken. Um, we heard several people here tonight. We talk about the number of petitions that actually got signed. I think that tells a pretty big story. I think the people have spoken. And, um, and then lastly, the number one reason why I don't support this measure is that the majority of my constituents, the people who have called me and emailed me, do not support this and they are asking me not to support it. And at the end of the day, I represent the people and not my own personal political career. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, deputies, if they clap again, uh, we will clear the room. Okay. All right. Now, I've brought it back to the board. Uh, any further discussion on this? Ms. Bullock or Ms. Caracas, do y'all want to say anything? I would like to, um, since I have the swing vote. <laughs> um, never felt such love. Um, I feel like I'm dividing the baby here. But uh, first of all, I'd like to say I want to apologize for to the people that um, emailed me or called and I was unable to respond to them uh, due to my husband's very serious illness. Um, but um, I'd like to first address the um, interview. Um, I've always taken the high road. Um, I always try to do that. Uh, you won't see me out on Facebook saying ugly, horrible things about people. Raise your hand if you've ever seen me say anything on Facebook. Not a one of you could do that because I don't do that. In fact, there were people who wanted to be a part of my campaign, and I saw that as what they did, and I told them thanks but no thanks. Um, when I spoke on Channel 4, or on the news, whichever channel it was, I said that I preferred elected with qualifications. I also gave Mr. Um, Van Zant credit. I said he's made some important decisions, career and technical academies. I'm very supportive of that. I also said during his 12 years that um, he should have gained some background, okay? That's, I said he should have gained some. But anyway, so that's, I just wanted to kind of clear that up because that, I, I've always said elected with qualifications. Anyway, I'd like to go on and talk about, since you chronicled things, I'd like to chronicle things. Before I was ever sworn in in 2012, I began receiving phone calls, one right after the other, asking me who to select as the chairman of the board, who my vote should go for the chairman of the board. Several of the people didn't even know the person's name. I had to give them the name. They were told to call, told to, this is who they should do, and some of them didn't remember the name, but I had so many calls, I knew the name. So that was one of the first things that happened in 2012 before I was ever sworn in. Uh, then, um, one of the first votes that was taken was for um, a lobbyist. It never even got a second. It did not go to a second. The next thing I hear is from friends who are eating in a, a local establishment that I did not care about the youth in our community. These were fellow Kiwanians who told me this. Um, I won't say who said it. That person knows who they are. When I lost my vote four to one, four people voted against. I was the only one voted for in favor of the Orange Park Performing Arts School. I did not go through the streets of town saying that the board and the superintendent did not care about the arts. I lost the vote. I knew those members had their reason for voting against it, and that's, that's the way it was. I moved on. When we questioned the funds about the Dare to Think conference, um, the next thing I know in the paper, uh, Mr. Van Zant's speech appears, and it says that um, certain board members do not understand freedom, and they do not care about our country, something to that effect. My dad was a World War II veteran. He was at Pearl Harbor. I can assure you, nobody cares more about this country than I do. Later, when Master Board was offered, it was offered to all five of us and the superintendent. 
Three of us took advantage of that. The purpose is to become more knowledgeable board members and to learn how to work together as a team, learn how to communicate. Three of us attended, and so did Mr. Van Zandt. Uh, as time wore on, Mr. Van Zandt did not attend anymore. Um, in fact, during one of the meetings, he got up and left, and the presenter was very offended by that. And we apologized, and we moved on. Um, my personal phone and text messages have been compromised. Uh, one statement was taken totally out of context. And I hope you don't mind if I mention your name, Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols and I had a conversation about his candidacy. It was nothing in violation of the Sunshine Law, but they only picked one little piece. And Mr. Van Mr. Nichols has never come before the board as any problem, as being having an uh, issue with it's gonna, an item coming before the board. It happened in January. This is July, so obviously it hasn't. Uh, but I was just giving him some advice about running for office. We had a meeting. Um, this past, the, the, when you talk about children over politics, I can not say this clearer than right now. This afternoon, we met, we have discipline hearings the same day as we do a board meeting. There were eight students that we saw today. Well, of course, I'm not going into any of their personal things. They all had a letter that was dated June the 19th. That's when we were supposed to see them. But unfortunately, that conflicted with a fundraiser that Mr. Van Zant had spearheaded and other people were going to, and that's fine, you can go to. But when he went to that, or we, first we were told that because we were gonna have stragglers is why we weren't gonna see them in June. I looked at every one of their letters, every letter said June the 19th, no stragglers. Okay, so we, um, so then um, he asked us to have another date. I'm diligently looking at my calendar. Later I realized it was because of this fundraiser is why he didn't want to meet. So I emailed and said, I'm unavailable. I have to be on that date. Then we get a letter from a staff member saying that um, there's professional development that day and we will not be able to have it. Of course, the professional development was not held here. It was held, held at the Thrasher Horn Center. So in other words, did a fundraiser in lieu of doing our students who waited a month before they could find out what discipline was going to be. One of those students was an ESC student. Anyway, I could go on and on. I have a list, but I'm not going to. Um, so if you wonder why I'm thinking differently, I just told you why. Thank you. Ms. Kirikas. Well, I can't top that. Mrs. Bullock hit the nail on the head with so many things that have taken place over the last two years, including all our principals coming to all our meetings now. And I apologize that you're required to come and sit here, all the senior staff, and the principals that have been speaking so very outspokenly at these last three months' worth of meetings. I'm sure all their jobs are very secure. They have nothing to worry about. They've done a great performance for the superintendent. That really is not what it's about, although Mr. Van Zandt, there's no secret, it's oil and water between you and I. We do not get along. But it is about the kids. And for those of you who think you're losing your right to vote, you have the choice. You can go in the, in the we put it on the ballot, you go and vote and you decide which way you want and you will be heard. If, it, if you choose elected, it stays elected, and that's fine. And if the voters choose to have an appointed, then we have an appointed. And then we can set qualifications for the most experienced and qualified superintendent that we can recruit. It doesn't have to be here in Clay County. It can be from outside the county. You don't have to agree with me, but this is my opinion. Um, and I do believe the fear is that three people on the board would be choosing, and I would be the one who would suggest that a policy be written, that a committee be um, combined, uh, just like Orange Park Town Hall chose their town manager. A committee of people that are business owners, parents, teachers, administrators, homeowners, residents, whoever wants to be on the committee, we choose a number, choose a number and they decide, they vet all the applicants, and they send their top three or their top five. That's what I think it should be done so that the citizens are really choosing who the next person would be. And we can even get input from the citizens on what exactly they see as the qualifications that would be required. 
but it needs to, we need to bring our district to the next level. We need to be able to compete with St. John's, and we're not. And we're not the great district we used to be. We have dropped a little bit. We're still a good district, but we're not in the top five. So I think that this is something we need to have so that we have somebody that is leading our district, running our schools, doing the day-to-day, -day, and actually doing it. So this is why I feel very strongly that we need to bring our district to the next level. Thank you. Can, I'd like to say one more thing. Um, Ms. Bullock, you know, I think you have the perfect solution, and I think you stated it back in March, and I think the solution is, and it really is the great compromise, we don't have to give up, we don't have, the people don't have to give up their vote, but if we could, I mean, I would consider yeah. I would consider figuring out a way or finding a way to put some sort of qualifications around a candidate. And I don't, like I said, I don't know whether we can do that or not. It's but not I legal. Think that that's, it's, yeah. it's not legal. Well, it's in Florida law. So that's kind of at our hands. Um, are you through? through. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot that I would like to say. Uh, there's been... Um, some pretty um, strong accusations made against certain members of the board, but um, I want to be very careful and not say anything that might come up at a later date. Uh, these things that are, we have been accused of, um, uh, the public needs to understand. Uh, some people will say things and whether it's the truth or there's any validity to it or not, I think they think that if they say it enough times over and over that maybe they start believing it. I don't know. But I'm not going to dignify um, accusations of collusion and sunshine violations because I feel like the proper venue will determine if there was anything done wrong there. Um, the, the timing is extremely convenient, but, you know, um, sometimes people look for an issue at election time. Uh, I've seen it happen in past elections. Um, the, the difference, I think Ms. Graham brought up, well, maybe we should have stronger qualifications for the school board members. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, Ms. Graham, but the thing is, is the superintendent of schools is in charge of running a $300 plus million dollar business, so to speak. Um, he or she is here to run the schools on a day-to-day -day operation. Um, if, like many of our past superintendents, have had experience in the classroom and as an assistant principal or principal in the county office as an administrator, they've kind of eased into that over the years. Um, we cannot set qualifications on an elected superintendent. Um, a school board member, however, sets policy and budget. And, and one thing else that I have found too uh, that I think is very important for the school board members, and we've been on longer than any of these up here, Ms. Graham. Just like today, I had a phone call from a parent. Uh, the school board serves as a liaison between the parents and the county office. Um, I think that's because they feel that they can, <coughs> excuse me, email us or call us uh, and I really think that, uh, and I'm going to refer to a board member that you and I served with a long time who did not have a college degree, and I assure you was one of the best board members who ever set foot on this dais. And uh, I do not think, uh, I have had three years of college. I happened to find the, the man I wanted to marry, and I married him. And he was going too far away, so I did it. And I will be married 50 years in September, so I'm not apologizing to anybody. But let me tell you something. I don't think that you could compare the qualifications that needed for a superintendent of schools with the qualifications 
for a school board member. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Our jobs are totally different. Now, uh, a lot of people have enjoyed calling names of people. Uh, as Ms. Bullock referred to Facebook, I am not calling names. I do not care what people say on Facebook. Uh, one of these days, maybe I'm feeling froggy at a board meeting, I'm going to tell you some of the names we've been called. You probably wouldn't believe it, but because these come from fine Christian people. But this is what is happening on Facebook. Uh, I've seen pictures on Facebook identifying me when I wasn't even in the picture. I've seen pictures on Facebook identifying Ms. Bullock is up there getting petitions signed for children over politics. I was up there that day, and I was helping Ms. Bullock. And let me tell you what, Ms. Bullock never went near the children over politics table. She had her own table, two tables up. Mr. Nichols can say that. But you know what? They get on Facebook and they say, Ms. Bullock is up there getting petitions signed. They said that Ben Wortham was up there and had spent the day getting petitions signed. Do you know that Mr. and Ms. Wortham came up to vote? They were there maybe 10 minutes. They came by, talked to Tina. I said hello to them. They were in a hurry to go somewhere. They never went you know, and, and it was, they were there all day getting petition signed. There is a conspiracy. They're colluding. This is what's going on. There's a conspiracy. Now, actually, Betsy Condon was next door. <laughs> I'm not through talking yet. I want, I want, uh, if complaints have been filed against this board, uh, we will handle that in the proper time. Uh, I want you to show me where there's been any sunshine violations or collusions, uh, and then we'll let uh, maybe the legal people take care of it, okay? Yeah, I'm not but it's, to... it's pretty bad to stand and accuse sitting board members of things that there, it's just because they've said it so much now it sounds good, and collusion seems to be one of your favorite words. M Madam Chair, I wasn't, I'm not standing in judgment of whether no, you guys not. had sunshine violations or not. That is not for me to determine. Sure. What no. I'm saying is that there's a perception in the public that sunshine violations no. occur, and the appearance of it, I think, is a problem. Well, I am not suggesting, I, like I said, I said it at the special meeting. That you didn't let me finish just talking. The presentation on how okay. inappropriate it was. Just, All right. I'm saying is that a, there's a connection between this whole we'll, children over we'll politics. Get this, thing. We'll get this solved. Ms. I'm not saying you guys violated something, but I am. I will say this though about that: that if this measure does pass tonight, and it is determined by a commission on ethics that sunshine violations did occur, then everything we've done here will be null and void. Okay. So. Okay. I won't take that as a threat. It's not a threat. I'm okay, let's have a vote. All those in favor, indicate aye. indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. Motion carries 3-2 with Ms. Bush and um, Ms. Graham and Ms. McKinnon dissenting. Okay, uh, there, are, there are no uh, items under deputy superintendent. There's no human resources items. Uh, Mr. Bickner, you've pulled C25 indemnification agreement between digital data maps and Clay County School Board. Yes, ma'am. The reason I pulled it is that up to the time of this morning, I still had not been able to get information sufficient to uh, change the indemnification agreement to something that I would recommend. It's broad. It's uh, something that's illegal for us to sign in the form that it's in. This evening, or this afternoon late, I met with Diane Cornegay and Cherise Stewart. I got information from her, Ms. Stewart, which would allow me then probably on Monday to reach an agreement on the indemnity agreement. So what I'm asking the board to do is to approve uh, this, but with the following provisions. Number one is authorize me to negotiate the indemnity agreement so that it's legal to be signed, and number two, authorize Mr. Van Zant to sign the indemnity agreement once I've done that. Okay. That should take place no later than Wednesday of next week. It would eliminate the need to bring it back to the board. It's a weather system or weather, weather predicting system and, and 
scientific system. They want to put it to school. It's a great idea. We need to get it done this month if we can. Okay. So the motion would be to approve the item, but to allow me to negotiate the indemnity agreement and Mr. Van Zandt to sign it. Okay. And I just I'll move, move approval. approval. I have a motion by Ms. McKinnon. I'll second. Second by Ms. Caracas. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries 5-0. Now we're down to presentations from the audience and I have two, about five cards before we get close to the end. Uh, first, Wayne Geiger. These are our three-minute cards that do not um, relate or, or talk about the agenda items. These are just things that people want to talk about that's not on the agenda. Thank you. I'm Wayne Geiger from uh, Keystone Heights. Uh, this is kind of anticlimactic. But uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with and serving under many of the people here in the last 25 years. And uh, I feel that they know me very well. And as one who has personally, at times, overreacted to doing a heated situation, I feel I have the right to bring this to the board. During the board meeting on June 19th, the heated discussion over personnel was directed at our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Tony McCabe. <clears throat> After Ms. McCabe gave her interpretation on the legality of the statutes, she was verbally assaulted, her, her competency was questioned, and she was treated with blatant disrespect. Ms. McCabe is one of, or possibly, the most competent and respected member of our county staff. It would be civil and in order for the chairman of the board and its attorney to offer Ms. McCabe a public apology. Folks, we're all on the same team. And we need to treat each other with courtesy and respect. Thank you. Okay, Marjorie Cowett. Uh, Marjorie Coet, and I live at 5375 Painted Pony Avenue, Melrose, Florida. When I saw that the three names were stricken from the agenda for the scheduled citizens request tonight, and I learned that they were stricken mainly because Mrs. Stutter did not approve of their topics even though they followed board policy, I felt compelled once again to speak to you. Having spoke to you before about the importance of citizen participation, I see you still do not comprehend this concept. So tonight, I would like to appeal to your sense of greater good, meaning the importance of right and wrong and trust and truth. At different times, I have heard each person presently serving on this board state that they are a Christian. Some evidence of that, the board voted, I think, unanimously to add in God we trust to the seal back there on the wall. I believe saying that you are a Christian means that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, believe in the truth of the Bible, and follow it as a guidebook for every aspect of your life. Since each of you have stated that you are a Christian, I would like to remind you of the following passage of Scripture. Ephesians 5:18 to 26 from the Living Bible Translation states, when you are guided by the Holy Spirit, you need no longer force yourself to obey God. But when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritism that is encouraging the activity of demons, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticisms, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group, there will be wrong doctrine, envy, murder, drunkenness, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there is no conflict. 
Those who belong to Christ have nailed their natural evil desires to his cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Then we won't need to look first for honors and popularity when, which lead to jealousy and hard feelings. I don't believe your attitudes and actions reflect love, joy, and peace. I believe they reflect hatred, fighting, jealousy, and anger. I don't believe your attitudes and actions reflect faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, but reflect complaints and criticisms and the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. Your actions and attitudes are not reflective of the Christian behavior you say you possess, 